weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 101 Everywhere. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 13 degrees. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Ottawa City Council voted against bylaw amendments yesterday during the second last meeting of this term. It would restrict major project developments from going ahead. With the details, here's City News reporter Perushka Gobolkista. Concerns of residents were top of mind for council when they voted against the proposal to build a couple of four-story residential buildings in an industrial park on Stacy Drive in Canada North. Area Councillor Kathy Curry suggested that this is not a long-term solution, saying that this could limit access to transportation and other amenities for residents. Similar concerns were felt when Council voted against another proposal for the 16-story tower at Wellington Street West and Parkdale. Now Don Horwire, the interim GM of Planning Real Estate and Economic Development, was asked if these two projects decisions clash with the city's density housing plan and sometimes um, you know staff make their recommendation but uh, committee and council are the decision makers now the next city council meeting before the municipal election is on Wednesday October 5th Perushka Gobelkista City News now two of the candidates who would like your vote for mayor in Ottawa have policy announcements coming up today Mark Sutcliffe will be on the Rob Snow show at 11 o'clock this morning talking about his approach to transportation in the city Catherine McKinney, also at 11 o'clock, will announce their plan for climate. A release from their campaign describes it as a bold climate action plan for the city. City News Time, 9.02. And now your forecast. Here's meteorologist Jill Taylor. Autumn arrives tonight and it is going to get a lot cooler, cooler air with that northwest wind. Some showers this morning, otherwise quite a bit of cloud. 14 degrees the high tonight. Mainly cloudy and a cool low just four degrees tomorrow sun and cloud a brisk northwest wind and 14 that's a high today 14 and right now in ottawa and in smith falls it's 13 degrees we would likely take this cooler weather over the storm about to hit some areas of the country residents of atlantic canada and the east end of quebec bracing for hurricane fiona the storm remains on track to slam into the east coast late tomorrow heavy rain in the forecast tomorrow night some flooding likely in some areas environment canada warning of possible severe and damaging gusts coastal storm surge and pounding rain Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says our country will continue to listen to science when it comes to COVID-19. Several cabinet ministers have confirmed the government is discussing whether to continue with border restrictions that are set to expire at the end of the month. Trudeau says the government has followed the advice of medical experts throughout the COVID pandemic. And we will continue to do that. And I can assure you uh, that when we make decisions on how we can move forward and uh, change the situation uh, around various uh, tools that we have in place, to keep Canadians safe, uh, Canadians will be the first to know. Now, the cabinet has not made any final decision, but is set to meet this afternoon when the prime minister returns from the UN General Assembly that he attended in New York. This is the final day of debate in the House of Commons on federal bill C-210. This, if passed, would give the right to vote to anyone over the age of 16 right across the country. The vote won't come for several days, but the Ottawa NDP riding associations have called for a rally on Parliament Hill in support of the bill. That will take place this afternoon at 4 o'clock. They're hoping to convince MPs to adopt. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. got the news and the views. He's got views on the news. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. September 2222. First day of fall. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Thank you so much for listening. All these years. I really appreciate it. Coming up. Author and post media columnist Randall Denley. He covers city issues for the Ottawa Citizen and he covers provincial matters for the National Post. And today we are going to talk about housing and how it's playing out as an issue in this red hot municipal election campaign of ours. Randall is 
not really all that impressed with what's on offer from the candidates so far when it comes to solving Ottawa's housing affordability problems. And he's really not all that impressed with the way the city bureaucracy handles the planning file either. He says there's too much micromanagement going on with both politicians and city staff. What came to mind as I was reading his column this week is um, that old line, too many cooks, too many cooks, too many cooks spoil the broth. Uh, I mean, just read the newspaper today. It's, you could make that case. Everyone ag- agrees. One of the problems, not the only one, but one of the problems with housing affordability is that there's a shortage of houses, supply and demand, right? Lots of people want to call Ottawa home because it's a great city to have a home and raise a family. And people come from all over the world, and that's what they want to do. And yet you read the newspaper today, headline, Ottawa City Council opposes contentious development projects in Canada North and Hintonburg. Now, are Canada North and Hintonburg full? No more room in the inn? So in Hintonburg, proposal is for a 16-story building right at uh, Wellington and Parkdale. Okay? 16 stories, not 60, 16 And what do we hear from the downtown lefty councillors all the time? Sprawl is bad and cars are bad and we need more intensification. We need to live inside the green belt, live where the services are, live near right, right, you know, live where light rail is. Oh, like, say, Wellington and Parkdale? (laughs) So here's a development and what it is not is sprawl. 16 stories, again, not 60. And the city council will tell its lawyers to fight it at the Ontario Land Tribunal because the locals are concerned about the transition between high-rise and low-rise development in the neighbourhood. So you see, these these downtown councillors, they're all for intensification until it happens in their neighbourhoods. Quote, Planning staff supported the proposal, saying it satisfies the intent of all relevant policies in the city's current and new official plan. And tell me again how the developers run the city and have politicians in their back pockets. And then in Canada North, where staff endorsed another proposal and said it followed all the rules completely in line with the new official plan, 250 units in two four-story buildings. Four stories! Oh, my gosh! In Canada North! If this goes ahead, it'll look like Singapore! But residents who attended public consultations indicated concerns about height, density, and traffic. Right? In other words, I have my house, and you can't have one. Full. Canada North is full. Housing, housing, housing in Ottawa. You can't have it downtown, and you can't have it in the burbs either. Even if the developer follows all the rules. Randall Denley in five minutes from now. Also on the show this morning, Ontario Politics This Week with our weekly panelists, Andrew Brander, Lindsay Maskell. Kind of quiet at Queen's Park. The legislature isn't sitting and won't until late October, and we have two parties. The New Democrats and the Liberals need new leaders. You remember Stephen Del Duca and Andrea Horvath called it quits on election night. Now Del Duca is running for mayor in Vaughan, and Andrea Horvath is running for mayor in Hamilton. There's a candidate about to announce her intentions of seeking the leadership of the Ontario NDP. Merritt Stiles is from the Toronto area, has been the education critic for the NDP during most of her time at Queen's Park. I believe she was a school board trustee at one time. Very sharp. 
one of the top performers in opposition, in my own opinion. So we're going to look at that leadership race and uh, all the ins and outs of what's happening with the Ontario Liberals and uh, what that party is doing to try and find a new driver for the minivan. <laughs> hey, we talked a lot yesterday about public transit and OC Transpo, and I was asking you what it would take to get you out of your own vehicle and on to OC Transpo, you know, trade in the car keys for a Presto card, go car free. You know, what if OC Transpo was free to use? Not many takers on that. Not many takers on that. A lot of people told me yesterday all kinds of stuff. It's not going to happen. It would take a miracle. I need my car. OC Transpo isn't reliable. It takes too long to get me where I need to go. Or I have children and I need to take them here, there and everywhere. And I can't do it. Relying on OC Transpo. Just like a myriad of impossibilities. So we're going to get into this today. Again, uh, transit transportation, one of the candidates for mayor in this fall's municipal election is Mark Sutcliffe, and he is out with his transit transportation plan. He calls it balanced and accuses uh, Catherine McKenney of going all in on bike lanes but that the Sutcliffe plan is more balanced and that he's not declaring war on the car. I had a chance to interview Mark Sutcliffe this morning, interviewed him about an hour ago, and we'll play the whole interview coming up uh, after the 11 o'clock news this morning. Also on the show, Professor Elliot Tepper, because it's a complicated world, and he's going to help us try and make sense of the chaos. Professor Tepper is Distinguished Senior Fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Russia and Ukraine will be the major topic this morning. What a week it's been. If Putin calling up 300,000 reservists, there was um, a report from Reuters earlier in the week suggesting this is um, the first such mobilization of its kind by Russia since the Second World War. But that's since been clarified, and it says uh, Russia actually sent thousands of conscripts to fight in Afghanistan in the 1980s and later in Chechnya. Then you have the threats about nuclear weapons repeated this morning by Medvedev, another Putin mouthpiece. Weapons of mass destruction, this is no bluff. Uh, you have these sham referendums in the occupied territories. Uh, Russia did that with Crimea in 2014. It's a total repeat of that. And uh, backlash on the home front with more than a thousand brave Russians taking part and taking to the streets in anti-war demonstrations even though it means they're likely going to jail. So we get into all of that and speaking of anti-government protests, are you following what's happening in Iran? Masa Amini, beaten to death by the morality police of Iran. Her death has ignited protests like we haven't seen in years in that country, and the government is now restricting access to the Internet. But could it be? Come something bigger than that. We'll ask Professor Tepper when he joins us after the 1130 news. And in between all that, there's you and the talk back hour. And this morning, I also want to talk about housing. A really in-depth report released yesterday by Statistics Canada. Home ownership rates are down in Canada. And the percentage of people who rent is increasing, especially for younger Canadians. It's always been high, but now it's, it's getting higher than percentage of renters. 50%, I found this interesting, 50% of the condos in the downtowns of Canada's largest cities, according to Statistics Canada, are investor-owned. 50%. Investor-owned, not occupier-owned, or owner-occupied, please. Um, I was struck by that figure. Meantime, Manulife 
is out with a report on housing, and it says despite falling home prices in some markets, prices haven't been falling in, in Ottawa, but they in other markets they have. Despite that, affordability is getting worse because of higher interest rates. The price of the house is down, but the monthly payment is not down. It's up. Up so much that it now takes between, get a load of this, between $8,600 and $35,000 more in additional annual income to buy a home depending on what city you live in because of what has happened with interest rates recently. It's no wonder the young Canadian adult feels they can't catch a break when it comes to buying a home. So what I want to know this morning is what is that noise? <laughs> what I want to know is how that compares to when you bought your first home. If you're over 40 or over 50 or over 60, think about the first home you bought, your very first home. Could the 30 or 35-year-old you afford that house now? That's a conversation starter after the 10 o'clock news, and we'll see how the hour goes on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Closed captioning is brought to you in part by Raven Reads. Unbox Indigenous Voices. Subscribe today at ravenreads.org. You see a lot of these luxury rental apartments that are coming out, and if you're a single person, it makes it extremely challenging to afford um, just basic lifestyle needs. The Canadian film and TV industry recognizes it's time to build a better workforce, which includes more opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and persons of color. HireBIPOC.com is here to help make this happen. Whether you're already in the business, trying to get a start, or in a position to hire, HireBIPOC.com can connect you to the right people. From script to development, production to post, distribution to marketing. Check out HireBIPOC.com now and help build a stronger industry together. Behold Emily Carr, painter about to encounter the force that will consume her life. How tightly they sealed their secrets from me, humble and pleading before the great trees, awaiting the invitation from the spirit to come meet me halfway. Nothing is still now, everything is alive. At last, I knew I must see through the eye of the totem itself. The mythic eye of the forest. Seldom able to live by her brush, before she died in 1945, Emily Carr was in the first rank of Canadian painters. This is my country. What I want to express is here and I love it. Amen. Enjoy the fresh outdoors. Play an important role in the lives of school-age children. Get paid to make a difference in your community. Become a crossing guard. We are currently recruiting crossing guards for the school year. We offer a competitive wage with various perks and opportunities for bonuses. Join the Ottawa Safety Council in keeping kids safe in the nation's capital. Find out more at crossing-guard.ca. Join me for season three of Paula Roy's Favorite Foods. Whew, that was a lot. I think I need a nap. I need to know that my voice matters and feel like my opinion is going to have an impact on our society and our youth.
show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Author and post media columnist Randall Denley back with us on the Rob Snow Show here on City News. Good morning, Randall Denley. Good morning, Rob. You will be uh, signing books. You'll be at a book event coming up soon. Tell us yeah, about that. The uh, Cumberland Heritage Market. It's at the Cumberland Museum. Great event. We were there uh, a few years ago doing uh, books, and there's about 100 vendors. They haven't had this for two years, Rob, because of COVID, so they're pretty excited to have it back, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting some readers out there, be signing my new book, The Long Hurt, as well as all the others, of course. Okay, excellent. Sounds like a great event, Randall Denley, and uh, best of luck with that, and hope uh, people finally get out and get to meet you, and you'll sign the book for them. Be great. Be great. So important to have those events for local authors. So it's great to see them back again. Let's talk about uh, the mayor's race. We're not very impressed with what's on offer in terms of housing policy. Why? Uh, it's not surprising, but it's a bit disappointing. Uh, Catherine McKinney's primary focus, I think, is on more uh, social housing, affordable housing. Uh, the homeless, these are all good things, but you know the bigger picture really is how does an ordinary person with an average income ever think about affording any kind of home ownership in Ottawa, whether it's a condo, apartment, townhouse, single family home, it's just getting more and more out of reach because we don't have enough housing supply. And uh, Bob Shirelli makes a reasonable point Maybe we should look at the official plan again because a lot of the future growth in that plan is in a Taywin community in the east, which is disconnected from everything else. It's a reconciliation thing, but how does that really, how is that really going to help with housing supply in the short term? Mark Sutcliffe, I think, has the best balanced plan on this. Okay. He wants to make it easier to develop, but I don't think he goes far enough and in this column i'm trying to suggest how we might look at things a bit differently rob because it's when you look at the production of housing in ontario it's where they were building nuclear waste plants or something it's just so <laughs> regulated everything about it is oh, regulated yeah. 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 and even after all the rules and regulations and all the hoops you have to jump through to build something then councillors basically on a whim can bring something to council and say nah and we really don't like it. Yeah. They had a couple there a, a few weeks ago, one apartment building in Canada. They said, ah, I, I don't like it in that spot. So, don't like it no. There. No. Yeah. And then another one, eh, we don't need the look of it. It doesn't look good enough. So, yeah. no. The transition from low rise to high rise is not appealing. Um, yeah. It, you know, but the thing is, you know, if I could just interrupt there, because this kind of stuff drive, it must drive people mad. Um, you know, uh, we have a, we have a housing supply shortage here. So we have the uh, you know this proposal for Parkdale and Wellington, you know, close to public transit, right downtown, near all the services, uh, inside the green belt, green sustainable intensification, uh, meets all the rules of the official plan. No, we don't want it. We're going to fight it. Um, here, this Canada thing, two four story buildings. Uh, two four-story buildings in Canada. No, I don't like it. I'm worried about the density. Well, I thought we wanted more density. I mean, some of these councillors, I get it. You know, they have a little uprising in their their wards, and it's an election year, and they're afraid they're not going to get reelected. So they want to suck and blow at the same time. Yeah, they're all in favor of uh, intensification in theory, but... <laughs> And so a lot of people in the public, I think, but they're not in favor in their own neighborhood. And, well, exactly. You know, at some level, Rob, I think we just have to respect that. If you live on a street as it is, maybe a single-family home, that's what you buy. You've been there for years. Do you want it to change? No, you don't. That's why I think we need to focus more attention on uh, suburban expansion. That's where our growth can come quickest, and it should be where it is, I think. Because when you talk about um, intensification, you get the kind of problems you were just describing and a lot of these things are just small projects too you know you get all kinds of barriers to something that's going to provide hardly any additional housing so we're not going to solve our problem that way although the official plan pretends that we will have intensification yeah yeah speaking, of pretending, of, is going to come. Yeah, speaking of pretending uh, there's a there's a um 
a great theme that's running through this municipal election campaign that developers run the city. Well, <laughs> um, and they, you know, and they can buy a politician or a candidate for twelve hundred bucks, right? We know yeah. that these accusations are out there. Well, you know, you, the two examples that you cited and I cited in my opening commentary this morning, this one at Wellington and Parkdale, endorsed by the city staff, meets all the regulations under the official plan. The same one uh, in Canada North, endorsed by the staff, meets all the uh, relevant regulations of the official plan. Um, council doesn't want either of them. Uh, even though I'm sure developers contributed uh, $1,200 to some of these ward councillors. So tell me again how developers run the city. Yeah, that, that's a thing that's been around, Rob, for as many years as I've covered City Hall, which is about 30 now, I guess, and it was long, around before that, I'm sure. It's just a, it's something people believe, and you certainly you can create that appearance if, as a candidate, you accept a lot of money from developers and then you see some projects say, hey, that one sounds great. Someone will say, well, look, but yeah, but look at all the money you took. So I think in that case, Mark Sutcliffe is on the right track because he's not taking money from developers. They just don't have to deal with that issue. Nobody's going to be able to point the finger if he becomes mayor and say, oh, sure, Sutcliffe, you know, but look, you took the money from developers. But what I think we need to do is just think about what makes housing development so unique and unusual that it requires enormous amounts of scrutiny from government, which is costly too. Uh, what is the point of it? What exactly are we accomplishing it? But it's, it's like, well, yes, we have to grow, we will, but we're going to make it difficult. That, that just doesn't marry up with the, the demand that, that we have. I mean, according to studies that have been done, we're already 24,000 homes short in Ottawa today for the size of our population. So we got a lot of catching up to do, even if we didn't add any additional people. But we know the city's going to grow. So how do we meet that demand with this kind of an attitude? And, and to me, it would be to have a, a lot more permissive approach to development and get political fingers off things. You know, I don't like to see things come to council so that councillors can express their opinion. That's all it is. It's their opinion. Between council and the province, they get to make all the rules of government de development. So, as you say, when somebody said, okay, we've read the rules, we fit our plan into the rules, and this is exactly what you asked for. Well, okay, it's what we asked for, but it doesn't mean we want is it. <laughs> I mean, how do you run a business like I that? I know. How do, you run, how do you run a business? How do you run a city like that? Yeah. All right, Randall, we have to wrap it up there for this week. Your book hey, signing Rob? events again are when and where? It's uh, Saturday, 10 to 3, and it's at the uh, Cumberland Heritage Museum, which is on uh, Old Montreal Road. Excellent. Thank you. We'll speak soon. Okay. Yeah, Thanks, Randall well. Denley, a post-media columnist and author. Ontario Politics This Week is right after the news on The Rob Snow Show on City News. chef I'm sharing some of my Italian family secrets come join me and see what they are while I prepare a traditional Italian pork feast just more of a push for indigenous languages being heard seen um, whether it's in the media or just on signs on the road culture and language is such an important piece to reconciliation and I feel like that's the goal that I want to see so just more indigenous languages being uh, lifted and promoted and encouraged and spoken and just heard. Hi, I'm Meg from AIM Fitness and I'm here with my buddy Fit Finley. Join us every week for Fit Over 50. We'll take you through some low impact and high intensity workouts designed to improve your strength and your balance. All you'll need is a resistance band, some light hand weights, and also your water bottle and a sturdy chair. Tune in right here on Rogers TV and let us be part of your weekly routine.
October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. <laughs> This is City News 1011 everywhere. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 14 degrees, and here's what's making news this hour. Two candidates for Ottawa mayor are releasing more information on their plan for the city today. Mark Sutcliffe has addressed transportation with more cash for councillors' traffic calming in their wards, more money for road improvement and winter clearing, as well as promises for Para and OC Transpo. Catherine McKinney will be unveiling their climate plan in about an hour and a half from now at Hunt Club Forest. That's at the end of Billy Bishop Private. Their campaign calls this a bold climate action for Ottawa. Two more provincial police officers being laid to rest this week. One killed in Mississauga. The funeral was held yesterday for Constable Andrew Hong. The second, an officer killed in a crash with a drunk driver while the officer was on his way to work in Markham. This comes as a national memorial to officers killed is held on Sunday on Parliament Hill. Some 200 officers began a march to the hill from Toronto this morning. Fiona has now strengthened into a powerful Category 4 hurricane. Winds are over 200 now. It's grinding across the Atlantic Ocean. Fiona forecast to pass near Bermuda early tomorrow, then hit easternmost Canada early on Saturday, likely over Cape Breton. Environment Canada warning of possible severe and damaging wind gust. Coastal storm surge, pounding rain in Atlantic Canada, as well as the eastern end of Quebec. City News Time, 932. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time for Ontario Politics this week with Lindsay Maskell, Liberal Strategist, former advisor to Premier McGuinty, and Andrew Brander, Vice President at Crestview Strategy, former advisor to the Ford government. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Yep, great to speak with everyone. So, according to news reports, Toronto area MPP Merritt Stiles will announce her intention to seek the leadership of the Ontario New Democrats. Lindsay Maskell, what do you think of her chances? Well, I'm not surprised to see her putting her name forward. Um, she's very ambitious and uh, did actually, I think, did a great job during the pandemic uh, on the education file of being out in front, being able to get a fair amount of media coverage in a very difficult time and did become fairly well known through that. She... Um, I think it's fair to say she has more polish than Andrea, uh, but we also have not seen her, you know, being challenged in a full debate. We've seen her be um, fairly charming and, and quick, uh, quick-witted and, you know, lots of potential. But again, potential. the big challenge in Ontario is that just that, you know, downtown Toronto, Davenport riding, kind of seeing what her connection would be with the rest of Ontario that is uh, that is also seat rich and very important in being able to have a diversified campaign. So I think today at her announcement for running for leader, you're hopefully going to see that reflected that she'll be looking for some outside of Toronto support and names to be there with her. Okay. What do you think, Andrew Brander, Merritt Stiles, NDP uh, <laughs> leadership candidate? I'm sure your phone is ringing off the hook. She's asking uh, you for uh, advice. Yeah, <laughs> they're certainly asking my advice. Um, <laughs> I think, as Lindsay said, uh, worst kept secret in Ontario politics, Merritt was, I think, the only NDP candidate smiling on election night after the party had uh, had lost 10 seats. True. Um, <laughs> really, really uh, interested to see what kind of tone uh, she takes today, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, front and center on the education file in recent years, especially through the pandemic, siding with uh, the union leadership on, on keeping schools closed. Um, I certainly think uh, that uh, she can use that um, very effectively during 
this leadership process to, to mobilize her supporters while uh, while we've talked a lot about how the trade unions have you know in in large part uh, been a bit more shaky um, moving moving their political allegiances I think most of the education public sector unions squarely still in the NDP camp um, and and vote and mobilize during these leaderships um, so, so look, I, look, I, I think she's been a very effective critic uh, of this government, probably the most effective, um, and uh, I, I, I think that will continue to be one of the biggest attributes that the party membership is looking for in their leaders. Um, but that says a bigger problem because that says mm. to me, in, in all their messaging, all they aspire to be. Uh, is is the opposition and is a critic to the government as opposed to um, you know those new ideas. So hopefully we start to see some of those in in whatever she talks about today. Okay. Um, but but if she's going to just position herself as as a critic, then uh, and and aspiring to be nothing more, then I think members might be looking for something more in their next leader. I mean, none of us on this panel are really hardcore New Democrats, but. Um who else might run? So, Jennifer French? So, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I mean, I do think, I, sorry to jump in. That's okay, Andrew. Yeah, I don't ahead. know if you yeah. were going to throw there, but um, I actually think uh, one of the biggest threats um, to someone like Merritt uh, would, would be another candidate. Um, who, as we said, sort of, as, as Lindsay said, presents themselves a bit more of, 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 of as a centrist, um, can, can make the case um, that uh, their best fortunes are found uh, while they continue to eat into these liberal votes. Uh, I, would, I would note that the NDP um, has been very effective always at organizing at the community level uh, and influencing municipal levels of government. Uh, unlike the federal conservative leadership, what's interesting about the timeline they've put in place for this is entries allowed up until December. Uh, so what I'm watching for um, is the potential of a, a high profile progressive candidate um, who has a very strong showing in some of those other regions Lindsay talked about in, in the province um, who want to see some growth, who might not end up winning their municipal race uh, and then decide oh, I to, see. Okay. to make, That's to make the switch yeah, okay. into, uh, into, the, uh, yeah. into the NDP. What do you think about that, Lindsay? So I actually think sort of a different version of that would be someone who has been sitting there laying in wait because of the tension between her and Andrea. Andrea completely did everything to sideline anybody with some ambition and potential. And that name uh, that rings to through that for me is Catherine Fife from Catherine uh, Fife, okay. Waterloo. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, she is very likable, very effective. Um, uh, she was once going to run as a liberal, so she can definitely oh, find okay. that centrist space. Um, and she is so well loved in her region. And they, like Kitchener Waterloo region, basically believes that, you know, Andrea was sidelining her and she's just been waiting for her turn. So I am looking forward to seeing how, how that evolves. And then we're also, I would expect we also have an existing MPP from the north or far north that would like to run. But I, I do agree with Andrew. It would be interesting to see if uh, if we get anybody externally uh, at this point. So yeah, I'm really, um, I was really surprised when Joel Harden ruled it out, <laughs> um, who's won twice now in Ottawa Centre. And um, I just called up the results from Ottawa Centre. He won by almost 18,000 votes <laughs> in Ottawa Centre. And uh, he's on my show every week, and he always says, Jack Layton's my hero, Jack Layton was my mentor, all of these things. Makes me wonder if he's maybe not... And, and on election night, I should, I should say this, on election night, he didn't even wait for Andrea Horvath's speech to, before he called for Andrea Horvath to resign. <laughs> like, yeah. So He was first out of the gate to say Andrea Horvath's got to go. So maybe he's waiting for a different leadership opening. Maybe he's wait exactly, Lindsay. You know, maybe he's got his eyes on a bigger prize. So we'll, we'll playing a longer game, perhaps. Uh, ex you read my mind, Lindsay. So 
Uh, Lindsay Maskell, what's happening with the Liberal leadership race? What, 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 where is this in the planning process? Well, in the planning phase, actually, what has to happen first yeah. is a convention that actually determines how Ontario Liberals will select their new leader. Uh, you have to have March. a convention about the convention? Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, because we, we, uh, with that, everybody had made the commitment that that would have been our last delegated convention. So our convention that elected Stephen Del Duca in March of 2020, the right at the... Yes, of one the of pandemic. Ontario's very first super spreader events. I remember it well. <laughs> the... Um, that event did not um uh that uh, that event was a delegated convention so those are the conventions that people remember from long ago that are made for television that show yeah. of crossing the floor oh, yeah. and yeah. it's not one number one vote and no, it's so the it is, wheeling and dealing in the smoke-filled yeah, back rooms little, right yeah. yeah and it 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 can feel a little um not as connected in grassroots so for uh local riding members and also has the significant cost of having to travel to vote and to participate. So I think the party has been looking at removing those barriers. There's very few um, delegated conventions left. So that uh, change of the constitution has to happen still for uh, the Ontario Liberal Party. But of course, the members will get to vote on it. So it's not a predetermined outcome. Okay. Uh, so that convention will have to happen first in the winter. And I would expect what we would see is that people wouldn't necessarily come out before that, but you'll start to see some positioning. And at that convention, you would probably see a big presence from potential leadership candidates. Okay. Let's uh, switch gears a bit here. So in our mayor's race, here in Ottawa, the debate is really heating up. Cars versus transit, cars versus transit and cyclists. So sound, as residents of Toronto, does that sound familiar to you at all? Uh, yes. Andrew, <laughs> anything? Ring a bell. Um, we saw this more or less play out, I think, in the recent Ontario election. You know, the, the battle over the highway and... Uh, things like that. but So what can we learn, say, from the recent Ontario election about how this might play out, Andrew Brander? Well, I mean, I, I, I think I think McKenney certainly looking um, at, at the results for the Tories in, uh, in, in Ottawa and not seeing a huge amount of growth uh, for, for them. Um, certainly this, uh, this promise um, uh, of 250 million for for bike lanes, uh, you know, I'd, I'd certainly give give points for being bold, I suppose. Um, oh yes, but I, I I do think I do think uh, it, it it seems to be rather you know tone deaf looking at looking at the results across across the province as well as as well as simply what's changed even in the last few months in terms of priorities for people, uh, cost of living. Um, housing and uh, right. and just affordability issues. Okay. You know, you look at Ottawa's budget last year. They made a commitment of thirty three million dollars um, to to build housing, and you're saying, okay, now you're going to spend, you know, close to eight times that on bike lanes. On bike lanes, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, That's a great and, point. Uh, and 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 literally nothing else in that in that two hundred and fifty million dollar commitment. Um, so so I think you know I think. Sutcliffe's plan uh, seems to be a little more balanced, um, and and uh, but you know ultimately I I, I suppose if, if McKenney's tapping into uh, that you know that downtown support, uh, it's it's certainly a way a way to mobilize your supporters to get to get to the polls. Um, unfortunately, the bike lanes aren't aren't built yet, so I'm not sure they'll be able to get there. But we'll we'll see. <laughs> right, right, right. But it is reminiscent of, uh, you know, that, you know, it's, it's urban versus suburban battles, right, Lindsay? Is, yeah, it, is that how you see it, too? Or? Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's a fight I don't really understand because I am a bit of a hybrid of that I'm, I, for certain, drive my car every single day, but I also live by High Park in Toronto, which means that I do feel the war on the bike and that I have been pulled The war over. on the bike? The war on the yes. bike. Okay. The war on the bike. I didn't know there was it. I didn't know we declared war on the bike. But there yeah. is. There is so much media attention in Toronto about uh, cyclists being pulled over in High Park. There is a large amount of policing in High Park for mm. speeding on your bike. I have. Oh really? I have been okay. pulled over for a warning. 
You got pulled so, over for a warning for speeding on yes. your bike? Really? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So, and it, there is so there are so many articles about it, and there seems to be, um, you know, a bit of a. Uh, so it, it would say this side the the car side is winning. They did in this past election. It was an election about highways. It's you know it's smart to campaign saying, especially in Ottawa, we're going to be looking at some other. Uh, options for how you're going to get around with obviously lots of challenges around the LRT and obviously, yeah. you know, all of the gridlock. Yeah. But it's not an immediate solution and it also has to be in proportion to, you know, big issues in major urban centers like the cost of housing and affordability. So it is, um, it has created a dividing line and I think the lesson out of the City of Toronto campaigns and from the, uh, from the provincial election yeah, is that it's totally okay to go to war against people on people on their bikes? There's a <laughs> lot of hostility towards them All right. for some reason that I that I don't understand. Andrew, and yeah, Andrew, are you a soldier in this war on the bike here? Or <laughs> are you in the trenches I, on this or what? So, yeah. so my my only my only <laughs> war against the bike is the sheer spike uh, that I've noticed during the pandemic of of the amount of people both uh, partaking in the gig economy by becoming uh, Uber Eats and DoorDash and Skip the Dishes type type delivery delivery drivers all going around on e-bikes. By bike, yeah, by Um, bike. And and, and honestly, uh, nine times out of 10, they're riding on sidewalks uh, instead of of the streets. So I will will admit that, that, you know, that says something that they, they feel it, safer to be dodging in between uh, pedestrians um, <laughs> uh, especially while I'm trying to walk my Uh-oh. walk my golden doodle down the, down the side <laughs> of the road and she's, she certainly is a huge fan of, of e-bikes and likes chasing them and becoming all sporadic yeah probably a them. huge fan of whatever's <laughs> uh, uh, being delivered as well that's, right that's yeah. right that's yeah. right yeah. so uh, you know there's there's certainly uh, certainly some areas of, of enforcement that need to be done <laughs> Um, but uh, but but uh, that would be the extent of my uh, of That's my funny. my bike complaints these days. Okay. All right, we'll be back. It's Ontario politics this week. Uh, a little bit of a municipal focus continued when we come back. Talk about uh, the most boring race in the province, Toronto. When we come back, uh, Rob Snow Show, City News. Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. What are we doing about COVID? Seems like the communications have been all about how everything's opening up, and yet here in Ottawa, we're experiencing our seventh wave, so a bit of a contradiction there. Are you a woman experiencing abuse? Do you know a woman experiencing abuse? Help is available any time of day or night. Sheltersafe.ca is an online map that helps you find a women's shelter or transition house that meets your needs so you can live a life free from violence. Sheltersafe.ca. Help is just a click away. I'm Mallory and I was walking home one night when an impaired driver hit me. He had been overserved in two bars before getting behind the wheel. If the servers would have called him a cab instead of serving him more alcohol, my life would be the same as what it used to be. I think servers play the biggest role in keeping us safe because it's up to them what state the person's in when they leave. Refusing service isn't personal, it's the law. I'm Julian Armour from Music and Beyond. Join us for a new show this spring on Rogers called Music and Beyond Presents. Flooding is causing widespread devastation in Pakistan. More than a thousand people have died. One third of the country is underwater and six million people are in need of emergency assistance. 
the humanitarian coalition is responding to the crisis in Pakistan. You can help. Donate today at together.ca and your donation will be matched by the Canadian government. That's together.ca, the humanitarian coalition. Together, saving more lives. That's the way I kill my skills shopping because I've been here shopping it. What's going on, y'all? It's Jay Morris, a.k.a. your favorite light skin. And you're going to check out my performance on Encore Ottawa 3 coming up this week. Let's go. Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. Voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Ontario politics this week. Andrew Brander, Lindsay Maskell. Let's talk about the city state, Toronto, center of the universe. Boring race, right? Very boring. Very boring. Yeah. Lots of challengers, but no. What, Lindsay? No. No race to speak of? Yeah, no, no race. People There's like 24 like, people signed up. Yeah, yeah, and people are kind of just waiting for John Tory to be done, right? And oh, okay. the next race will be the interesting one. That'll be the change although, election? The next election will be yeah. the change election? Okay. Yeah, although I do have to say there's a, you know, there's a really interesting person putting some interesting ideas out there, but it's just tr- how tough to get traction. Okay. And they, uh, it was actually the former head of parks and planning in Bogota of all places, right? So a little, there's Bogota. A little international. Like in Colombia, you mean? In Colombia, and his okay. brother was the mayor of Bogota. And so he's oh, okay. the person I'm seeing putting some interesting ideas out there. Um, but really, you know, it's just nobody's going to break through with any traction. And we're seeing a lot of the same tricks from 2018 of, you know, all of the debates being canceled and just sort of not... Uh, not any, oh, not really? any real okay. interest. Right, that's interesting. Um, when I asked Mayor Watson what his advice would be for for John Tory for a third term, Mayor Watson said, uh, "Don't do it." <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's what Jim Watson said as uh, he kind of limps advice. limps to the finish line uh, with a, a light rail fiasco in his wake. But um, you agree? Boring. Just kind of waiting for the next election, and that'll be the change election, Andrew, for Toronto. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's it, and I think that's right. Uh, I think it will be the next election, quite, uh, quite frankly. Um, you know, I used to work for John Tory at Queens Park when he was leader of the opposition way okay. back in the day. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, I, I, I was, I will say, I was absolutely surprised to see him, especially after the pandemic, wanting to, uh, wanting to reoffer. Um, but uh, but he loves the city, and uh, and I think people see that, and I think that's uh, that's that's why, um, in large part, have have sort of left it left it to him. I think arguably his his approvals are are quite high, and everyone thinks he's uh, he's done a great job, and most of his commitments so far have been. You know, committing to recommit to the things he's already yeah. committed. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, that's like I, smart I, track, right? I, smart track is dead. Sure. <laughs> no, but I saw uh, John Tory affirms commitment to twenty-eight billion dollar transit plan, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, like, it, you're already building it. Like, what is there to?" affirm or commit to you, you know well i mean i mean i think the biggest criticism of john tory in the past has been he's he's been known to change his mind from time to time so sometimes now he has to come out with announcements that he's not changing his mind oh, okay yeah okay <laughs> all right you're gonna fill in the subway tunnels and stuff okay all right um the plowing match is in our neck of the woods uh the international plowing match is in kentville so um you been there, Lindsay? Plowing match, international many plowing match. Many times. Many times. Many times. Oh, yeah, I bet. Right? I bet. All those years with Dalton. Oh, how was well, Dalton on a before. tractor? How was Dalton on a tractor? <laughs> he could get a very straight furrow, that's for oh, sure. Oh, well, okay. Nothing like, putting, uh, nothing like putting politicians on a tractor and having to teach them how to do a straight line. <laughs> yeah. 
What about you, Andrew? Plowing match? Yes. Yes, yeah. I was there yesterday, actually. Oh, you were there yesterday. Been, okay. Been to uh, the plowing match for many years, often as a staffer, as Lindsay said. Uh, now I have the privilege of, of attending with one of my clients, uh, which is uh, Spirits Canada, uh, who are great partners with the grain growers. Um, as you know, rain makes corn. Corn makes Canadian whiskey. And that that song goes on Spirits, like that. Um, Spirits Canada like that. is your client. Spirits Canada. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They are. So, wow. uh, so we uh, we go every year, um, and uh, and you know what? It's a it's a fantastic event. Uh, you see you see often uh, a whole bunch of urban uh, MPPs make their one venture out of out of their ridings uh, for for the year to sort of connect with. Um, rural Ontario and really make those connections with uh, with those ridings in terms of the impacts because they you know they don't see it a lot but obviously the the plowing match moves around the province as well so it really gives uh, politicians who who aren't aren't really all that familiar with uh, rural issues a, a chance to to hear them <laughs> hear them directly from from the people. <laughs> all right, that's interesting. Okay. We'll wrap it up there for this week. Great stuff, everybody. We'll speak soon. Thanks. Have Thanks a great again. Week. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay Maskell, longtime liberal, used to work for Dalton McGinty. Uh, Andrew Brander is with Crestview Strategy. He's vice president there, uh, both joining us from Toronto. So uh, coming up after the 10 o'clock news, lots of news in the last few days about housing. Uh, we have housing policies from all the candidates in the municipal election. I want to know this. You know, $707,000 was the average selling price for a home in August uh, in Ottawa. And despite these uh, higher interest rates, uh, housing prices in Ottawa, according to the Ottawa Real Estate Board, were, were actually up, according to its most recent report, not by a whole lot, but by 5% or so. $707,000. How much did you pay for your first house? When my father bought his first house in the late 70s, he paid $18,000. How much did you pay for your first house? How old were you when you bought your first house? And what was the interest rate? Do you remember? And then think of that house now. If you were the same age again, or old, you were 30, 35, whatever it was. Maybe you were younger than that. My, bad, my dad bought his first house when he was 23, 24 years old. Could you afford a house like that now? Like the first house you bought? 750-1310. 750-1310. 613-750-1310. After the 10 o'clock news on City News. Jim Deeks, host of Canada Files. I hope you'll join me each week for interesting and informative discussions with some of Canada's most impressive people. I mean, policing in every community is going to be challenged. The community policing model is already a harm reduction response to the way that they police. I just think that we have, again, another opportunity to use police for the things that police should be used for and then develop some other avenues for things that we can take off a police officer's plate because it's just not what they should be doing. Maggie, Mrs. Calabash, come into my kitchen. A quick mayonnaise, egg yolks, garlic, Dijon mustard, lemon juice, olive oil, immersion blender. Go down, come up. Voila, mayonnaise. Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. The houseless crisis because it really is a crisis down here on Rideau Street. There is not enough shelters for men especially and uh, we need to be helping our most vulnerable. Every year 
Dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety. Visit StopTrackTragedies.ca. CIW 1310 AM in Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 everywhere. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 14 degrees, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. One candidate for Ottawa mayor has put forward what he calls a balanced approach to improve the city transportation and transit. If elected, Mark Sutcliffe says he plans to increase investment in road maintenance and winter clearing budgets by $100 million over four years. He tells City News that he doesn't want to focus on one aspect of the transportation plan, for example, if residents have to rely on bicycles to get around the city. And we have to respect the fact that a family in Canada is not going to take their son or daughter to hockey or ringette practice in February on a couple of bikes with their hockey bags on their backs. They're not going to take their mother or father to a medical appointment in January on bicycles. Seniors and people living with disabilities are not going to travel around the city on bicycles in the winter in Ottawa, Canada. Now, Sutcliffe also plans to modernize bus routes and the scheduling of OC Transpo that would help residents post-pandemic and help them rely on public transportation, especially if they live in the suburbs. Now, the Catherine McKinney campaign for mayor is highlighting the environment today. They will unveil the climate plan for the city. That's coming up in about an hour. The release of what the campaign calls a bold climate action for Ottawa will be at 11 o'clock at Hunt Club Forest. That's at the end of Billy Bishop Private. Uh, by the way, more from Mark Sutcliffe on his plan coming up on the Rob Snow Show about one hour from now. City News Time 10.02. Now your forecast. Here's meteorologist Jill Taylor. Autumn arrives tonight and it is going to get a lot cooler, cooler air with that northwest wind. Some showers this morning, otherwise quite a bit of cloud, 14 degrees the high. Tonight, mainly cloudy and a cool low, just 4 degrees. Tomorrow, sun and cloud, a brisk northwest wind and 14. That's the high today, 14. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it is 14 degrees. Emergency management officials in Nova Scotia urging people to be ready for Hurricane Fiona. The powerful storm is expected to make landfall late Friday or early Saturday somewhere along the eastern shore of Nova Scotia or into Cape Breton. The expectation right now is that Cape Breton will be the hardest hit by this storm. Impacts from Halifax, though, east and north, southern New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, eastern Quebec before affecting Newfoundland's west coast a little bit later on Saturday. An EMO official in Nova Scotia, Jason Mew, is asking everyone in that area to get ready. Being aware and prepared by securing outdoor items, furniture, you know, uh, items you might have on your patio, uh, trimming or moving some, you know, damaged trees or limbs, and, and just making sure you, everyone has their 72-hour emergency kit ready and, and obviously charging cell phones and, uh, and other devices just to ensure that you're as prepared as you can be uh, to weather out this storm. Now, having those 72 hours worth of necessities would include having extra batteries, water, non-perishable food, as power outages are likely, uh, once again, especially in Nova Scotia. The number of children under the age of five getting vaccinated against COVID-19 in Ontario is lower than the relatively small number some experts had expected. Shots for the youngest age group have been available for a couple of months now, but only about 6% of those children have actually had dose number one. Dr. Kieran Moore, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, says that is lower than the number he thought he would see, at least by this point. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. How much did you pay for your first house? How old were you when you bought your first house? What was the interest rate when you bought your first house? Do you remember that? What was the interest rate? Well, it's an 
It's people paying attention to interest rates these days. And then think of that house now. Say you were the same age again, okay? Could you afford to buy a house like that now? 750-1310, let's talk housing. 750-1310, And, you know, those questions, they're just kind of the conversation starters. Okay, just to get things going, and we'll see how the hour um, unfolds. How much you pay for your first house? How old were you? What was the rate? And, uh, you know, you found the fountain of youth, and you're the same age again. Could you afford a house like that now here in Ottawa? 750-1310-750-1310. Love to hear from you. Uh, Julie, up first and early is Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, how's it going? Uh, it goes. Yeah, with or without okay. me, it goes. Julie, how much you pay for your first house, Julie? Um, I was 29. Wow. Okay. And we uh, this was back in 79. 29 so, and uh, 79. Yeah, and the interest rate was 18%. Oh, my God. <laughs> and yeah. the house was the house was fifty eight thousand. Fifty eight thousand. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so where was the house? Like where was the house? Orleans. In Orleans. What kind of house would it have been for fifty eight? It was a, a single single two story. Okay. Um, you know, with uh, Georgian pillars, very very nice. Yeah. Big lot. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and I think. I think a lot of the difficulty I have with everyone saying, um, you know, I only paid this amount and, you know, the house is worth that amount. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is, you know, when your father bought his house, sure. what was his yeah. annual wage? Oh. We're, we're forgetting that. No, no, no. I, I, know, yeah, everything is relative. Of course, everything is relative. I know, but right? nobody yeah. mentions that. So everyone's yeah. always saying, I only paid 58000 I only paid 18000 My parents, when they moved to southern Ontario, yeah. I was, I think I was 14 or something, we yeah. bought a three-story brick home in Hamilton, one of those old homes that were built in the uh, late 1900s, but they were in the city. And he, they paid... Um, I think it was something like fifteen four for it. Fifteen thousand so, four hundred. Wow. Yeah, three story. Three now story. Uh, I went that yeah. that was in uh, sixty four, I think something like that. Yeah. And you know, my father was not working. Um, he, he really was having a hard time. My mom actually had to go and work, so it was a struggle to get that house. And my uncle is a realtor, so he managed to get it for us. And there were some rental units in the house as well. Yeah. Now I went back. The house has been renovated, and it sold for almost two million. Almost two million. So wow. Yeah. Wow. Because it's in a wonderful part of of Hamilton. Right. Still the city, three story, all brick. We're, you know, uh, first floor ceilings were fourteen feet, and the baseboards were yeah. heavy duty, ornate. Yeah. Thick, you know, so, but let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Heritage. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Okay. You were yeah. twenty nine and seventy nine, Julie. Uh, yeah. You're twenty nine again. Think yeah. about that house in Orleans. Okay. You think you could afford yeah. that house in Orleans now? Well. What do you figure you know, that? It, you don't still live there, do you? Yeah. You do uh, no, still live no, in that I house? Or? No. 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 We sold that and bought two two more after that. <laughs> okay. But okay. Find, How much do you figure that house is worth now? That house. Now? Um, probably maybe eight. Eight hundred thousand, right? Yeah. Wow. We. Because they're all, you know, they're sort of climbing down. But I find that. Uh, it, it's different now in terms of managing debt load. You know, at 18% interest, uh, you know, it was a struggle. I bet. But we, you know, juggled things around. Uh, mortgages were really hard to get at that time, even at 18%. Things are different now in terms of uh, of debt load. Okay. Mortgages, you can carry a higher mortgage rate the mortgage debt load amortized over 25 yeah. so you think we make think it too about, easy to get no because it's not it isn't easy it isn't easy to go through that stress test right. where you have to be you know over so many percentage yeah, two points, points over yeah. you have yeah. to have so much and if you don't want that stress test you have to have that deposit that's really really a you know big chunk of change so i know that 
you know, uh, in terms of my salary at that time and how much my house was worth, it was probably uh, maybe two times my salary. Whereas now, two times the salary of you know a six hundred thousand dollar townhouse, you'd have to be making three hundred, and nobody's doing that. Okay. But it's just, I don't think we can compare how things were in terms of mortgage. Well, and, I think we can. And how I think we, we can. If we can, if you want to compare, say wages to house appreciation, I think it's. I think we can make that comparison. I think we. Can. You can do. I think the house appreciation has gone way beyond whatever whatever um, salaries are. Julie, I got to run. Thank you. Lots of people are taking me up on my offer to talk about this. I really love that first call, though. That's a great first call. South Mountain. Rob, you're on City News in South Mountain. Rob? Uh, Yes. Um, Rob? Yes. How much you pay for your first house, Rob? 109. 109. And how old were you when you bought that? I'm going to say... Early 30s. Early 30s. Okay. Yes, I was married and divorced and then remarried. Right, okay. So went through all that and then right. bought this house with my second wife. Okay. Do you remember what the interest rate was when you... Yes, 8.9. 8.9, there you go. Okay, all right. Um, um, you still own that house? Um, still live still in still that in house? It, yes. You're still in it? Yes. Okay. But it's a lot yeah. different house now than okay. when we started. How so, sir? Well, um, my wife has horses. She has okay. a horse. Right, okay. And we cleared the land by hand. Wow. Cut the trees down, put in a... It used to have electric furnace because they were pro, the government was promoting electric furnace. This house had an electric furnace. Okay. So I put a wood stove in. Right, right. That I bought in North Gore off a hay wagon for 250 bucks. <laughs> chimney and all. I got the whole tree. Chimney, chimney and all. Holy cow. Okay. Yeah. And all the trees we cut down, we cut up. Sure. And burned to heat the house. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lots of people still do that. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now that it's different, I do it with corn. I, I have a corn stove. But corn but stove. I think, okay. honestly, yeah. people, when they buy houses now, could I afford my house? The way it was back then, yeah. now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The reason why is... Like, do you think 30-something, Rob, you could could afford that same house? Yeah. But you couldn't afford it the, the way, way it, it is the now. Beginning, not the way it is now. Not the way it is now. Okay. Because we made it the way it is now. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, but people... Like, you sound like a very handy man, to- Rob. You sound like a very handy kind of man, right? I'm redoing my kitchen now. I, I cut... I made my cupboard boxes uh, like like your inner cupboards. Mm-hmm. I had a two side good uh, three quarter inch plywood. I redid my. I'm I'm doing it now actually. Okay, right, but, right. But people have to pull the reins back a little bit. Okay. When they look for a house. What do you mean? Pull the reins back. What do you um, mean? If you look in the seventies and the sixties, I, I know I was only a kid. I was only six years old. Right. But just from listening to my parents and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. When you bought a bungalow or something, say in uh, off Meadowlands Drive, okay, that little bungalows and some had a carport, some didn't, but they yeah. were all yeah. unfinished basements. Okay. Okay. And yeah. as people got more money, you know, they finish the basement. They finish the basement themselves, or they'd hire somebody to come in and do it, or whatever. They couldn't do it themselves, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Or yeah. people would get together and do that. Right. So you're saying now everybody wants everything they want, you know, the granite countertops and uh, exactly. the stainless steel appliances, and they want it all in one shot. If you were to it? take that out of a house and not make a house so big, not make it so big. Okay. I, my right. house, honestly, is 1,200 square feet upstairs. Yeah. I still have only one bathroom. I get away with one bathroom. Right. And believe it or not, we had four kids here. Wow. I raised them all. Busy bathroom. Well, you do that separate times, you know. I do mine after work at night. Yeah, okay. You know, my wife gets up at... um, Five o'clock in the morning, she has hers at five. Kids are all sleeping at five. So you're saying expectations now are way too high. uh, uh, Way too high, unreasonable, uh, whatever. Honestly... Okay. Honestly, I think most of our kids were like, like with the computer age and stuff like that. Yeah. I call it they were raised with a silver spoon. Okay. All right. We had to fight for what we needed, you know. Oh, I don't you know. It's kind of a fight now. Wouldn't you say it's a fight now? Seven hundred and seven thousand dollars for a house in Ottawa. Bro. Yes, but take all the uh, the granite out. 
take the finished basement Yeah, but out. you can't take the land away. You can't take the land away. The land is very expensive, right? Yes. 109000 wouldn't even get you a lot in Ottawa, probably. No, but I'm in the country. Yeah. And in the country, could I find a place? A lot for 109000 Yeah, I can. Okay. All right, Rob. Good call. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Be right uh, back. Ernie's in uh, Petawawa, Phil's in Orleans, and uh, a couple of people call him there. If you want to talk about housing, let's talk about housing on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Ladies, leave your men at home tonight. Hey, this is Dominique Orley. I'm a part of Encore 3, and be sure to catch my set this week. We are going downtown. Leaving out all your stress and your sorrow. Rogers TV presents a series of original creative stories animated by local authors for children of all ages. Join us for Ottawa Storytellers. A lot of you feel like you aren't able to be who you truly are. What's most important, more important than everybody else knowing who you are, is that you know who you are. As a young person, time moves slower for you. And just know that things will get better. It Gets Better Canada is a registered Canadian charity with a focus on uplifting our queer youth through the power of digital storytelling. As a two-spirit person, I use they, them pronouns, but that's not the case for every two-spirit person. There are so many voices out there that we didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago. No matter what your mind tells you, you really are perfect the way you are, so stop beating yourself up so much. I'm gonna be a boy in a dress, because why not? Your identity is explosive. We all have our unique journeys, but one thing that connects us all is the desire to be happy. The desire to celebrate being our authentic selves. Enjoy the fresh outdoors. Play an important role in the lives of school-age children. Get paid to make a difference in your community. Become a crossing guard. We are currently recruiting crossing guards for the school year. We offer a competitive wage with various perks and opportunities for bonuses. Join the Ottawa Safety Council in keeping kids safe in the nation's capital. Find out more at crossing-guard.ca. You see a lot of these luxury rental apartments that are coming out, and if you're a single person, it makes it extremely challenging to afford um, just basic lifestyle needs. Join me for season three of Paula Roy's Favorite Foods. Whew, that was a lot. I think I need a nap. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. How much did you pay for your first house? How old were you when you bought your first house? What was the interest rate on that first house of yours? Uh, and think about that house now and um, if you were the same age all over again. Could you afford that house now? Okay, 750-1310, 750-1310, 613-750-1310. 3, Ernie is calling from Petawawa. Hi, Ernie. Hi. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Ernie. How are we coming uh, in up there on Petawawa, in Petawawa, Ernie? Are you listening on FM radio, or what are you doing? Uh, I'm listening off of my iPhone. Off your iPhone. Okay. Yeah. We love that, too. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, first house. First house. Well, my first house, I'm a little different story than some. My okay. first house I bought up in northern Ontario. Okay. I was working for Kimberly Clark, people who make Kleenex, Kim White, sure, and sure. Stuff. Yep, yep. And it was um, kind of a boom on up there, and they were hiring a lot of people. And so the housing was um, what they would say expensive, but it wasn't. It was 25500 25500 for what kind of house? It was like a war four home. 
Do you know what a lower floor looks like? No, I don't know what that well, looks like. Well, they're no. they're the ones with the bedrooms upstairs where you have to sort of bend over a little bit to, to get in the bedroom, you know? Okay, all right. So, and then I had a bedroom down. So it was three bedroom, probably, I guess, I don't know, 1,000 square feet maybe at the most. Right. But anyways, uh, the company... How old were you, Ernie? I was probably about... 28 or so 28 okay when i when i bought and yeah. i was a tradesman so right. um making good money uh, about eight bucks eight something an hour at the time but and you bought a house making time. eight bucks an hour that's crazy isn't that crazy yeah like, but uh, you know i know it's all relative right it's all relative but you know just just i'll throw somebody else in here uh, when the people first bought houses there when the company started up you know the houses were worth like six thousand dollars and they and the, and the company held a mortgage and it just took so much off your check but the oh, way they okay. did it for us was because i was a tradesman they, the interest rate was 18%. They bought it down to 11%. Okay. And they gave me 25% to buy my house. Wow. Isn't that a pretty good deal? That was a really good deal. Wow. Now, that same house today is yeah. probably only worth about 130000 because it's a depressed area. Right. You know, but then I moved from there, and I'm I'm in a house in Petawawa. Yeah, I paid sixty-three thousand in 1984, okay. and I was still only making about ten bucks an hour. So I worked for Atomic <laughs> Energy of Canada. For Atomic Energy, wow, wow. Well, yeah, so I, I ended up working there, and until um, oh, a bunch of years ago, I went blind. And, oh, sorry uh, to hear that. Okay. Yeah. yeah so then I, re- I had to retire and whatnot. And but my house today now, I bought a sixty. I think the interest rates was about seven or eight percent back then. In eighty four. Eighty four. Yeah, I think okay. around that. And, I think uh, it would've, anyway, probably would have been higher in '84. I think. Yeah. Maybe a little higher. Yeah. yeah. I just it's hard to remember. You know. All yeah, yeah, yeah. But long time ago. I'd yeah. say my house today is probably worth four thirty, maybe, maybe a little bit more. I have an acre of land with the house. Right. 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 And it's a, it's a nice. Are you close to town? In town? Uh, well, we're sort of in the burbs here. Sort of in the burbs. Okay. You know, well, we got suburban septic, but We got okay. we got septic, but we got city water. Okay, that's an interesting combination. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just yeah. wanted to throw that in. So in 84, you would have been how old, Ernie, do you figure? Uh, in 84, I was born in 51, so what's the math? 33, something like that. 30, yeah, 33, 33 or so, okay. yeah. So 33, 34 yeah. year old Ernie, could you, you, you think he could afford well, your house? You no, know, I was that really house? worried. I, but yeah. I, when I sold my house, I doubled the price of my house, okay? So I had that equity to put on this house. Right, so, right, right. Okay. Uh, I was really scared. I went to the bank and I said, "You really think that I can make the payments?" Oh, sure. Well, you could you could get this amount of money, but they always say that. You know, they always want to give you more than what you. So here, you know, seven hundred and seven thousand. Like, how is a young person? How's you know, thirty-three year old Ernie supposed to afford a seven hundred thousand dollar house? Well, that's the thing. My son bought a house for five hundred and some thousand out in Canada, and now it's probably one point one million. Wow! You know, I mean, he, like even he said, like, "Holy gosh!" You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's tough for young people coming up. You know, yeah. I don't know what they're going to do. It's, it maybe like over in Europe, where you got uh, families living in the third floor, and another family on the second, and another family on the bottom floor. You know. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right, Ernie. Thank you. All right. Great call, bud. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Phil is in Orleans. Phil. How you doing, Rob? Good, Phil. How much was your first house? Um, that was about 25 year-ish ago. You were 25 years old or? No, 25 years ago. Tw- 25 years ago. Okay. All right. In Orleans, yeah. 111. 111,000, 25 years ago. What kind of house mm-hmm. was it? It was a mid-sized townhouse. Townhouse, okay. It was about okay. four, four and a half percent mortgage. That's not bad. And then we got rid of it around 2014, and we bought a single. Okay. And that's where I'm sitting now. Right. In Orleans, and, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. Orleans, yeah. Yeah. And it tripled in price. The one you're in now. Yeah, but I'm afraid to see the property tax. <laughs> <laughs> You know, right? Someone's got to pay. So yeah, um, and as far as people getting into the market, um, the longer people wait, the more it's going to cost. If 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 you even think I about doing so. it, yeah. you got to get your foot in the door sooner than later. That's probably the best thing I can say. Yeah. 
But some um, people, you know, they feel like it's impossible. You know? Yes. Whatever their, um, even if because of the interest rates, you know, the, some of the prices are going down, but they're no further off. They might even be worse off because the interest rates are, are moving up so yeah, fast, and, you know. And so. When the Russia war started, I broke my mortgage and refinanced. Oh, you did? Um, okay. In All April. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's interesting, Phil. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good to hear from you, man. Okay. A uh, couple of lines available there in Greeley. Paul, you're on City News. Hey, Paul. Good day, Rob. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Everything's good. So, I actually don't own a house. Don't uh, own a house. Okay. I've got uh, my mom's info here. So she bought a house right in Greeley. Yeah. Um, in 1981 for thirty-five thousand. Oh my um, It was a Guildcrest home. They owned the lot already, and the lot probably would have been around twenty thousand. Okay. Um, because it was kind of on marshy land, but that house today is probably worth upwards to 500000 and it's not a fancy house. Not a fancy house, okay. No, yeah. it's right in Greeley, and, you know, like, it needs lots of work, but I'm telling you, like, it, it's not, yeah, it's, I mean, probably, you know, 1,500 square feet. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, and it was I'm your mother's house, your mother's it's house. It's my mother's house, yeah, she yeah. still lives there. Um, she still lives and, there, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm renting right now. But I just wanted to make a comment on one of the previous callers saying yeah. how, you know, people have to lower their expectations. Lower their expectations, yeah. Unrealistic well, expectations. I mean, so. I've, I don't know how much lower I can I can go. I've, I've gone out to where he was, South Mountain, out in Ashen. I've looked at these places. I've even looked at a place that was condemned. There was mold <laughs> on the walls, mold on the floor, yeah. and it sold for $500,000. And It was condemned. I would need a construction uh, mortgage to buy the house. So I wouldn't even have been able to buy it regardless. Oh, my gosh. Um, but I just, anyways, my, my main point is, you know, yeah. I'm surprised to hear some of the older people calling in and saying, you know, well, you know, pretty much pull out your bootstraps. They want I, everything, I want you know. Well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, and a lot of guys I know, we're all tradesmen. You know, we do our own work on houses, and we're looking for fixer-uppers. But the fact of the matter is, like you say, the, the land is worth so much now. And, um, you know, if, if you want to try and get a down payment on a $500,000 house, you need 50 grand and it's probably going to need work. So anyways, that's my two cents. Have yeah, a good one. Good sir. one. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. That is wild. Condemned. <laughs> okay. We'll pick it up right after the 1030 news. Hang on everybody. Uh, how much did you pay for your first house? Uh, how old were you? If you remember the interest rate, that would be helpful. Interest rates very much in the news. Now think of that house now. And uh, think of you as that young person again. Could you afford to buy a house like that now? 750-1310. We're back right after the news. On this Thursday Rob Snow Show right here on City News. I need to know that my voice matters and feel like my opinion is going to have an impact on our society and our youth. It isn't the heavy trays that make the job difficult or the fast pace you need to keep up. It's not working another double because someone called in sick. What makes the job tough is the moment you realize a customer has had enough and you have to make that decision not to overserve. Refusing service isn't personal, it's the law. We know it's not easy, but we're counting on you to keep us all safe. Thank you, servers, for doing the tough job. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. Next time on Simply Cooking by Un Chef, I'm sharing some of my Italian family secrets. Come join me and see what they are while I prepare a traditional Italian pork feast.
news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 Everywhere. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Good morning. I am Dami Lola Onime. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, scattered rain shower 14. Here's what's making news this hour. Two Ottawa mayoral candidates will release new policies today ahead of the municipal election. Mark Stockcliffe will be on the Rob Snow Show in a couple of minutes to discuss his transportation platform for the city of Ottawa. Stockcliffe's transportation plan includes more money for road improvement and uh, winter cleaning, as well as promises for power and OC transpo. Meanwhile, Catherine McKenney will also announce their climate platform around the same time. A news release from McKenney's campaign describes their climate action plan as bold. Bill C-210 will be debated for the final time today. That's the bill that seeks to give 16-year-olds across the country the right to vote. The final verdict isn't expected for a couple of days, but the Ottawa NDP Riding Association calling for a rally on the Hill in support of the bill. The rally is scheduled for 4 p.m. Algonquin College is set to unveil a new commemorative monument next Friday. The sculpture is to recognize indigenous children who never returned home and survivors of residential schools, as well as their families and communities. The monument is created by local artist Barry Ranger to commemorate the discovery of unmarked graves at former residential schools across the country. The ceremony is packed with several activities, including a speaker series on the history of colonization from pre-contact to truth and reconciliation. September 30, the day of the event, is a national day for truth and reconciliation. City news time is 10.31. I am Damilola Unime. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. We're talking housing. How much did you pay for your first house? How old were you? Interest rate. I'd love to know the interest rate. If you remember, if um, when you got the mortgage, and uh, think of that house now, and uh, pretend you're the same age again, could you afford to buy a house like that now? Seven five zero thirteen ten. Who's been waiting the longest here? That would be this caller, and that is uh, boy, another call. South Mountain. We're big in South Mountain. The Rob Snow Show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sean. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, Sean. How much was your first house? My first house was two. 46 not uh, 249.6 249.6 okay okay how old were you when you bought that house um so it was a condo that was being built like basically uh you went in you looked at the plans and you picked one that you wanted yeah and so they weren't even under construction yet whenever i started paying for it okay where was this uh, Kempville. in Kempville. okay all right yes okay so anyways i I was 19 when we started our first payments on it and we moved in when i was 21. holy smokes how old are you now i am 32. 32. how'd you manage to do that by the age of 19 you're buying two hundred fifty thousand dollar condos how'd you manage to do that uh i have rich dad you got a rich dad no no two words my wife she's amazing with money she kept me on track focused and uh we put every cent away that we could we did live with family for about a year i mean still paying rent but right, we were right. able to put put away um it was about twelve thousand dollars for down payment good for you good for you so five percent down you bought it with something like five percent down yes it yeah. was five okay. percent down yeah. yeah okay okay um interest rate do you remember what the interest rate would have been on on that i think it uh, like you must have probably been a good rate. It was probably it was yeah. it was five between five and seven, I think. Between five and seven. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I think it was in that ballpark. What do you figure that condo's worth now? Do you bought it for two forty nine? What do you figure it's worth now? So I sold it uh, oh, sold. recently, and here's the thing: there was a lot of issues uh, with the condo because there was under underground issues with uh, uh, water leaks and. It turned into a, a fairly undesirable place to live. Um, okay. Okay. So I did sell. I sold it last August for uh, three twenty. Three twenty. Okay. However, yeah, they did sell more units, just like mine, for like three sixty. But 
it was because there was um, what they call a status certificate against the property. So had that status, and, and there was a bunch of stuff in litigation oh. with the township. Anyways, um, so. But still somebody hard. bought it, right, despite all that. Somebody did buy it. Yeah. Yes, somebody did buy it. And we and we had bought actually another house in South Mountain at that time. Um while we owned the other house, the bank knew of the situation. Like, the place was unsellable before COVID. Okay, so we ended up renting it out, uh, and we bought my great aunt's house in South Mountain. The house was built in 1985. Uh, she built it for $38,000. Oh, my God. And I bought it off of her for two hundred and fifty. Wow. wow. Uh, this was just pre-COVID, about a year pre-COVID. Still, and still a good price for a house, two fifty. It was a good price, yeah. It was yeah. two fifty, and it you know it needed a roof. Like uh, there was a bunch of stuff that was done, like new furnace and hot water tank and uh, sure. all of the, yeah. all of uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But uh, my dad owns basically the exact same house, very close to where I am, same plot of land, just over an acre, and he had to uh, he remortgaged. Uh, or, or his mortgage was up for renewal. Right, right. And uh, so he had to have somebody come in and, and uh, give a price on his house. Uh, his his price was uh, $750,000. Wow. Holy and he bought his house for 180 Wow. ish in that ballpark um, yeah. about 16 years ago. Crazy, crazy. So, yeah. So, I mean, we're talking about young people and how they're going to ever afford a seven hundred and seven thousand dollar house, which is the average selling mm-hmm. price in Ottawa, right? Yes. So, your advice is get a smart wife. Get a smart <laughs> wife. Isn't that the answer to everything? Uh, you know what? Um, we we didn't have any financial help we're going to say nobody handed us any money whatsoever right but we did ask some family obviously help us move in give us a space and um but you took you made some sacrifices though right you made some sacrifices right definitely without we were we were each only making 13 dollars an hour working at like a fast food restaurant or in the restaurant industry at the time so you know we made it work yeah made it work um the payments were about $1,200 $1,200 a month-ish Yeah, in that ballpark. So, right. I mean... Good for you, Sean. Yeah, yeah, yeah we made it work. But you, you know what? Living in a condo, simple life. You didn't have to, you know, we didn't have a lawnmower. We didn't have to look after the property. Yes, we paid our condo fees and all yeah. of that, but yeah. it, it worked for us at the time. And we're we're happy at where we're Good at for now. You. Good and, for you, um, Sean. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, bye-bye. All right. Okay. Cool story, eh? Uh, Gino in Ottawa. Gino. Yes, hello. Hi, Gino. Hi. How much was your first house? Uh, my first house was uh, in the range of 90000 Where was it? In the Glebe. 90000 in the Glebe? Yeah, but this was back in uh, 1980. Cow. 1980. What kind of house was it? Uh, just a single two-story house. Single two-story house. How many bedrooms? Uh Two. Two bedrooms. Wow. Yeah, we did okay. some renovation. It was three, made it two. I see. Okay. Tell me about your basement. Did you have a finished basement or anything fancy no, like base- that? Or? Basement was unfinished. Unfinished, okay. Unfinished, yeah. Right, okay. 90000 In yeah. 1980. In 1980. But Must have been a big interest rate. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I was about to say. But of course, the challenge at the time was dealing with uh, very high interest rates. Yeah. Uh, 18, I think actually mine was 21%. 21%. Oh, my but, God. But, you know, we pulled our bootstraps up and yeah. uh, made sure that the uh, mortgage was a uh, um, uh, open mortgage, which means, you know, you can pay down as much as uh, humanly possible. Right, right. So we uh, we paid off the mortgage p- pretty quickly. And by pity, p- pardon me, pretty quickly, what do you mean? Five uh, years, ten years, something like yeah, that. Yeah, within five years, yeah. You paid it off within five years. Wow. Yeah, ninety thousand. Yeah, ninety thousand. Wow. Both, both my wife and I were working full time at the time. Yeah, doing what kind of work? Uh, federal government. Federal government. Okay. Yeah. 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 You still live in that house, Gino? No, but the story, you know, the story progresses from there. Okay. You know, All right. Uh, you know, you know, we started. Uh, our family was growing, so we got three, three kids. Uh, so I moved on. Actually, 
purchased a lot from the city of Ottawa and built uh, in the Alta Vista area. Oh, yeah. Okay. So with the funds that we uh, uh, gained from the Glee property, yeah. we purchased a lot and built a, a, family, a larger family house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And what year would that have been? Do you remember, Gino? Yeah, it would have been the uh, year 1990. 1990, okay. 1990. You mind if I ask you how much it cost to build that house in 1990 in Alta Vista? 1990, I think uh, the lot was 150. Wow. Uh, the build was uh, just under 300. Wow. Must have been a nice house. Yes, yeah, a very nice house. Very nice a house. Yeah. Beautiful house to raise three children in. Yeah. You still live there? I still live there. You children still live have, there? <laughs> and the children have moved on. But, oh, they're, you know, they're grown now. Okay. They're grown. So yep. hence, hence the current problem for you know, children these days uh, facing um, you know, high house prices. Yeah. But like you said earlier. What do you figure that house is worth that uh, you're sitting in there? Oh, uh, over one mil. Yeah. 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 So but the, but the how do we fix this problem then, Gino? Well, I see this as a, a you know, it's, it's relative, right? Yeah. These days, all my children have full-time jobs, and most average salaries these days, depending on what the work you do, is usually about a hundred k. So, you know, it's it's relative to the home house prices, right? Okay. Uh, so, it's the best bit of advice uh, one can offer. You know, from people in my predicament to people just starting out, is you know, you have to make sacrifices. Sacrifices. You, yeah, sacrifices. Uh, uh, be very prudent and careful with your money, and put as much possible into the into the home because that's uh, eventually, you know, that's your uh, major and best asset to, to rely on. It's work for you, Gino. Yep. Great call, man. Thank you. Yep. All yep. right. Bye bye. Okay. okay bye. Uh, Ralph and Osgood. Ralph, you're on City News. Good morning. Hi, Ralph. How are you? I'm good, sir. How much you pay for your first house? Let's I paid get... sixteen thousand five hundred. Sixteen one six. One six five zero zero. Wow. In in nineteen sixty seven. Where? Uh, in up in Alta Vista. In Alta Vista. Wow. In Alta Vista. What kind of house? The, uh, what kind of house? It, it, it was a three bedroom bungalow. Three bedroom bungalow. Okay. A small three-bedroom bungalow. Yeah. Um, um, had a six percent mortgage. That's not bad. Okay. Uh, in fact, I even remember the payment was one oh five forty-two a month. <laughs> cheaper than a bus pass is today, Ralph. Cheaper Pardon than me? a bus. Cheaper than what a bus pass is today. Yes, you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right. But but it, it but if you're only making one hundred twenty-five dollars a week. Right. Uh, at, at at that particular time, then yeah. then. Uh, I guess it's all relative. And is that what kind of money you were making at the time? At that time, yes. What were you doing for a living? I, I was an accountant. An accountant, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, is that house still around, Ralph? Pardon me? Is that house still around in Alta Vista? Or? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I sold it in uh, uh, 1970, 71, somewhere in that range. Okay. I think I got 23000 for it. But uh, I drove by it by chance about a, about a month ago, and, and uh, uh, whoever owns it now is, uh, I guess, is renovating it uh, completely. It, it's, uh, they're changing all the windows, and there's a, a big dumpster in the front yard. Oh, yeah. And loading and stuff, so they must be renovating it totally. Yeah, yeah. But I, I would imagine it's about a, a seven, eight hundred thousand dollar home now. Amazing, amazing. Eh? You know, un yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so how's a young person supposed to afford that, Ralph? Well, well, I guess they right. can't. They, they, they can't. Uh, right? Yeah. We're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to build more houses. We're build more to, houses. Yeah. We're gonna have to get contractors uh, uh, or. Uh, we're going to have to maybe maybe even we're going to have to sacrifice part of the green belt again. Oh, that's off limits. You know. Yeah. Uh, they, well, they, you see, they, Councillor uh, McKenney says that they, they want to turn it into a park, like an official national urban park. Well, that's not going to happen. But. Well, it's not up to the council anyway to be up to the NCC, I, but. I, uh, I, I, I don't think she'll ever get cooperation, or not in my lifetime anyway. That that that, that that's going to see. I mean, they they many years ago they uh, 
they converted. There used to be uh, there used to be Greenbelt west of Maryville Road. West of Maryville Road. West okay. of Maryville Road. Yeah. Okay. Uh, along, alongside sure. of uh, alongside of Baseline, that that uh, they they built a large government building there. That that and it that was, was Greenbelt property. Part it it was Green Hill. Time. Okay. All right. Interesting. Uh, well, Laurentian High School is was was part of the Greenbelt at one time. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's a big shopping center now, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Big Walmart there. They're, big Walmart. Yeah. They're building sure. another. I, I well, I mean, that must have been ages ago, though, Ralph. I mean, it's all developed around there now. Oh, of course. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't uh, see, I don't, I don't, uh, there'd be small encroachments, I, I think, on the, uh, in, in, say, the, uh, uh, all, through, all through the green belt. I mean, if, 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 if they had kept John Baird's uh, idea, and I think that's still the best idea, where the civic hospital, you know, was going to be in uh, experimental farm, uh, right across the street from the existing yeah. civic hospital. Yeah. I mean, the perfect spot for it, but now they got it down on the, you know, <laughs> down where they've got to do, you know, ex- extensive, uh, extensive land development and everything else. Yes. Yeah. And people still, and, and people are still mad. Yeah. Right. Oh, a- absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I wrote to everybody that I knew at, at that particular time when the, uh, you say the current, the current liberal government couldn't couldn't stand the fact that uh, that the conservatives had done something right. Yeah, and, the and, only re- and, yeah, and I think to- even uh, Catherine McKenna was the minister at the time who made that decision. I think she has since told me she may have gotten that one wrong. No kidding. Yeah. You think so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Ralph, I got to go. Thank you. Fif- hey, Sixteen thousand five hundred dollars. Sixteen thousand five hundred dollars. Holy cow! Hundred and five dollars a month mortgage um a bus pass is 125.50 last time i checked 1046 rob snow show city news october 5th 2014 my daughter was hit by a train she was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world <laughs> Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. It was my daughter's birthday. She was blowing out the candles on her cake when we heard coming from the TV. So we stopped and listened. It helped us get to safety. That's why when I think of I think of my daughter's birthday, because now she gets to keep having them. On Thursday is daytime Ottawa. It is the first day of fall, so we're going to share with you some fabulous fall recipes. And of course, fall means some of the colder temperatures are coming, and that means cold and flu season. We'll give you some great tips on how to prevent cold and flu. And of course, we'll give you some great tips on if you do get the cold and flu, how do you battle it? And the Chio Dream of a Lifetime Lottery is back. They have an early deadline coming up. We'll give you all the details on Thursday. Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m., it's the RTV Quiz. Giovanni Petiti hosts a weekly trivia competition that lets you play from the comfort of your couch. Play along at home and challenge your friends. And don't forget to follow along on social media. Let us know who's top of trivia and you can find yourself featured on a future episode. Are you kidding me, folks? The RTV Quiz, Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. on Rogers TV or at rogerstv.com slash rtvquiz. Flooding is causing widespread devastation in Pakistan. More than a thousand people have died. One third of the country is underwater and six million people are in need of emergency assistance. The humanitarian coalition is responding to the crisis in Pakistan. You can help. Donate today at together.ca and your donation will be matched by the Canadian government. That's together.ca, the humanitarian coalition. Together, saving more lives. What are we doing about COVID? Seems like the communications have been all about how everything's opening up, and yet here in Ottawa, we're experiencing our seventh wave, so a bit of a contradiction there.
the way I kill my skills shopping because I've been here shopping it. What's going on, y'all? It's Jay Morris, a.k.a. your favorite light skin. And you're going to check out my performance on Encore Ottawa 3 coming up this week. Let's go. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Let's see how many of these calls we can get to in the uh, final eight minutes of the talk back hour. Paul is in Canada. Good morning, Paul. Yeah, hi, Rob. How much was your first house? Uh, I was uh, <clears throat> 210000 in 1999, and it was uh, kind of in the Maryville Road area behind the Toys R Us, that, that sort of area there. Oh, yeah, down there. Okay, yeah, sure, I know where that is. Yeah, 70s yeah. split-level houses and whatnot. Okay. And what remember, kind of house was it? What kind? Uh, well, it was a split-level. It was uh, 70s, uh, aluminum wiring, but it had been, uh, you know, where they put the copper on the ends there. But a uh, uh, really beautiful house, big, big lot. Uh, but we, we stayed there until 2000 five and sold it at about 260 and uh then we moved out to uh canada north here and uh bought a, a minto home well you got in just in time because canada north is full now in case you didn't yeah i heard that uh, actually do you have a, a, <laughs> are you interested in a comment an interesting zoning thing they did in mississauga uh are you interested in a comment on that? Or? Go ahead, sure. Yeah, yeah it's uh, my mom's place, a 1950s house down by uh, the QEW and the 427 and in, in just inside Mississauga. And uh, I, I grew up there, so it's a small house on a fairly big lot. Okay. And they rezoned, the city of Mississauga rezoned that entire area uh, where existing lots could be changed to multiple occupants. Oh, yeah, we're so, going to do that here, I suspect. Yeah, so... Yeah, we uh, have this thing called R1 zoning. So, you know, okay. in a situation like that, you can only have one residence on it. R1, residence one. Yeah. And then it goes, you know, two, three, four. How many residences can you have on one lot, right? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the the builders like it because, you know, they'll put more units on a lot. And, uh, yeah... Yeah, it's not going to go over very well in some neighborhoods where they're used to living next door to, you know, a bungalow with three bedrooms with one family, and suddenly there's going to be, you know, a fourplex next to them. It's going to create a lot of controversy. I oh, think yeah. it's going to yeah, happen, well, though. The, yeah. the thing with uh, this is they, uh, uh, kind of in this whole area, They, my understanding is they did the zoning, so it's not like you're going to have to, I assume that would smooth the path to getting approval in that area, for. and it's up to three stories now, right? So, right, right. Okay, so, interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to jump here. Uh, people have been waiting a while. Stacy is in Canada. You're very patient. Stacy, hi. Hi, good morning. How much was your first house? 134,000 in Canada in 1999. In 1999? Wow, that doesn't and seem like that long ago. What kind of house was it, if you don't mind me asking? A two story, two single, story. but technically a link home. So okay. they were very close together. Very close, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. What uh, part of Canada would that have been in? Uh, uh, Katimovic. Katimovic, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but something that you're saying is sort of not quite true. You're saying, how are first-time buyers going to buy the you know the average home first-time buyers don't buy the average home fair enough yeah they buy less than that okay so yeah less okay. than the average in 1999 sure okay and i have in full disclosure i'm a realtor right and i have 22 year old clients who just bought their first home it can be done. Oh, it can be done. Like, yeah, yeah. If you have enough kidneys to sell, I guess it can be done. The yeah. average <laughs> price of seven hundred and seven thousand. Right. Significantly less. Significantly less, like a, the four hundred fifty thousand dollar condo. Less than that, four hundred thousand dollar condo. Four hundred. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. What do you get for four hundred thousand dollars? Three bedroom. Where uh, do you get that two, three bedroom uh, condo for four hundred thousand dollars? I just sold it last month. Where? In Katimovic. In Katimovic. Wow. It exists. It like does? all this doom and gloom. I could sell you a 300000 It's not about timing the market. Hmm. It's about time in the market. I don't know. I'd like to it's see this $400,000 three-bedroom condo. Well, I could show it to you. It yeah. exists. I'm not it, in the market. You know, like <laughs> prices, prices have certainly... What's interesting is I still find there's a bit of lack of inventory out there. 
because as much as prices have come down significantly, the interest rates have gone up. Oh, yeah. And so somebody paying a million dollars at one and a quarter percent interest is paying the same uh, monthly mortgage rate as somebody who's now paying seven fifty at five and a quarter interest percent. Yeah. They're paying the same mortgage amount. Yeah. Yeah, they're no further ahead, right? They're no further so, ahead. Yeah, no, it doesn't yeah. make a difference. In fact, Manulife is out with a big report that says affordability has deteriorated, despite in some markets prices are down rather significantly. Houses, uh, you know, we have to distinguish, I guess, between houses and mortgages. You know, you shop for a house and you shop for a mortgage, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. 400000 for a three-bedroom in Canada? Are you? Come on. You're pulling well, my legs, Stacey. There's no garage. It's a condo. There are condo fees. Right. What, were the, what are the condo fees? Uh, 400 Oh, my gosh. Ooh. Yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Okay. Stacy. thank you. Thank no, it's you. a valid point you make, Stacy. I, I take it to heart. I do. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, Gail. Important. Hi. Gail. How much was your first house, Gail? Um, I bought a farm for my first house when you I was bought a five farm. years old. I well, it's better farm. than buying the farm, I guess, yeah. uh, Gail, right? <laughs> I, I did it myself. I didn't have parents handing me money. Right. Um, I how much? How much? How much? How much? $179,000 in Lindsay, and I paid 15% interest on that farm. Holy cow. Yeah, holy cow. It, it was like a, a GM height then when you were you were competing with all the GM workers. That oh, I see. Okay, yeah, big, yeah, Big yeah. wages and... and what I were you doing for a living, Gail? Driving a truck. Driving a truck, and, okay. And I worked hours and hours and hours and hours, and I farmed to, to make money too. The farm had to pay for itself. It was not easy. Yeah. And, yeah. You like, still have that property? Um, actually, I've moved to uh, Portland, and I uh, oh, yeah. okay. bought another farm that was like I paid two eighty for this farm here, but I mean the house needed tons and tons of work. Some of the neighbors told me I should have bulldozed it. <laughs> 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 so I mean it is right. it isn't about um, it, you know there are ways to do it. I I agree it's gonna, it's hard. It takes commitment. It takes effort. It takes you know you got to work lots, but it is doable. Okay. So, yeah. All right, Gail. Thank yeah. you. Thank Good you. to hear from you, Gail. Yep. Okay. Man, oh, man. Driving a truck. <laughs> Plowing fields. Planting corn. This is what it takes to get into the real estate market? I've got a moonlight as a farmer? <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay. Uh, Jason, we're going to have to wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow's the Friday free-for-all. If you want to get in on the action, we can do that tomorrow. Uh, coming up after the 11 o'clock news, I had a chance to speak to Mark Sutcliffe, candidate for mayor. I spoke to him this morning about his uh, plan for transportation. So I'll let you hear that interview in its entirety. And then we'll check in uh, with our city news colleagues in Halifax, where they're getting ready for Fiona. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, some people used the A word. They called it an accident, but it wasn't. An accident implies that no one was at fault. But when someone impaired by alcohol and or drugs chooses to drive, they're fully responsible for the crash that can result. So please, for the memory of my brother DJ and the thousands of families whose lives have been shattered by impaired drivers, let's drop the A word. A crash caused by impaired driving is not an accident. 20 bucks. Hi, I'm Maggie. Come into my kitchen. When you're using salt in a recipe, check for saltiness. Not all salts are equal. A fine grain salt is a lot more salty than a large grain salt because that takes longer to get into the food. Bum, 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 bum. 20 bucks. 
20 bucks. Hello, I'm Jim Deeks, host of Canada Files. I hope you'll join me each week for interesting and informative discussions with some of Canada's most impressive people. the houseless crisis because it really is a crisis down here on Rideau Street. There is not enough shelters for men especially and uh, we need to be helping our most vulnerable. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011. Everywhere. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Good morning. I am Damilola Unime. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it is 14 degrees, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. One mayoral candidate has put forward a balanced approach in hopes to improve the city's transportation and transit system. City News reporter Perushka Gopakista has the story. If elected, Mark Sutcliffe says he plans to increase investments in road maintenance and winter clearing budgets by $100 million over four years. But he tells City News that he doesn't want to just focus on one aspect of his transportation plan, for example, increasing bike lanes. I intend to bring a balanced approach to transport, transportation and transit in our city. I'm not going to prioritize one form of transportation over all the others. I am going to respect the people of Ottawa, including the people who live outside the downtown core, and give them the ability to travel around the city using different methods of transportation. Sutcliffe also plans to modernize routes and scheduling of OC transport routes that would help residents rely on public transportation, especially if they live in the suburbs. Perushka Gopalkista, City News. Meanwhile, uh, Catherine McKenney is highlighting their environmental plan for the city this morning. They will unveil the climate plan for the city in just a couple of minutes. The release of what the campaign calls a bold climate action in Ottawa will be at 11 a hung club forest at the end of Billy Bishop Private. With the weather forecast uh, for Ottawa and the Valley, here is City News meteorologist Jill Taylor. Autumn arrives tonight and it is going to get a lot cooler, cooler air with that northwest wind. Some showers this morning, otherwise quite a bit of cloud, 14 degrees the high. Tonight, mainly cloudy and a cool low, just 4 degrees. Tomorrow, sun and cloud, a brisk northwest wind and 14. That's the high today, 14. City News Time, 11.02. Hurricane Fiona is moving north in the Atlantic, sliding past Bermuda, where a hurricane warning has been issued. And it is expected to pick up speed tomorrow with Nova Scotia in its sight. City News reporter Alex Bloomfield is on Hurricane Watch. Emergency officials in Nova Scotia are urging residents not to take this storm lightly. We're looking very much right now at, at the message to the community and the message to everyone across Cape Breton to, to prepare, to prepare today, continue to prepare tomorrow for a very intense event on Friday evening into Saturday. A 24-7 provincial coordination centre opens tomorrow morning with landfall expected sometime on Saturday. Most models have the eye passing over Cape Breton and the storm may still be packing hurricane force winds. For now, those winds are over 200 kilometers per hour expected to bring dangerous storm surge to Bermuda later today in Puerto Rico 80% of the island is still without power for a fourth day leading to concerns the death toll from the storm's effects now under 10 could still rise Alex Bloomfield City News and some sports news for you tennis legends uh, Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal would team up in the doubles at the Lever Cup on Friday in what Federer has announced would be the final match of his long and illustrious career Federer has 20 Grand Slam titles to his name and longtime rival Nadal has a men's record of 22 major championships. The two will pair up for Team Europe against Team World duo of US Open semi-finalists Francis Tiafo and Jack Sock. The lineup for day one at the competition was announced earlier today and also includes Sir Andy Murray in singles action from Team Europe against Alex de Minot of Team World. The 2022 Lever Cup is likely the last tournament that will feature the big four, Sir Andy Murray, Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal for a while. I am Damilola Onime. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. 
world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. He's running for mayor, and Mark Sutcliffe is back with me on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Another uh, announcement about his uh, campaign released this morning, and it's about transit and transportation. Good morning, Mark Sutcliffe. Good morning, Rob Snow. It's great to be with you, as always. So, I want to uh, begin by asking you, how would you say your approach to transit and transportation differs from your opponents in this race? So I think this is one of the most important issues of the election, Rob, and it's one of the clearest examples of the contrast between my approach and Catherine McKenney's approach. And I intend to bring a balanced approach to transport transportation and transit in our city i'm not going to prioritize one form of transportation over all the others i am going to respect the people of ottawa including the people who live outside the downtown core and give them the ability to travel around the city using different methods of transportation Catherine mckenney's plan is going all in on bicycles promising a quarter of a billion dollars of bike lanes over the next four years borrowing that money to do it and it's a program designed to force people out of their cars it says nothing about the roads except reducing the use of them we have to repair our roads we have crumbling infrastructure in our city and we have to respect the fact that a family in canada is not going to take their son or daughter to hockey or ringette practice in february on a couple of bikes with their hockey bags on their backs. They're not gonna take their mother or father to a medical appointment in January on bicycles. Seniors and people living with disabilities are not going to travel around the city on bicycles in the winter in Ottawa, Canada. This is a a balanced approach that respects the needs of people throughout the city of Ottawa. Okay, let's um, let's talk about each aspect of it in a little more detail. And uh, outside of bicycles versus roads and cars, I do want to ask you about um, public transit, which has been in the news for many, many years. Uh, the troubles with public transit. Uh, OC Transpo recently revealed through the Transit Commission that uh, the deficit is about $85 million. Ridership uh, is up a little bit, but hasn't fully recovered, not even close, uh, from from pre-pandemic days. So um, what would you do about OC Transpo? This is um, an important core service. Its operating budget is $700 million a year. It's had a lot of problems as well. So um, what's your plan for OC Transpo, Mark Sutcliffe? So, Rob, we've got to fix OC Transpo. Uh, And uh, we're not going to do that by making transit free or moving further and further towards making transit free. We've got to get the buses going to the places where people need them to go. Right now, they're not doing that. It's a new reality post-pandemic. People are not traveling with the same patterns that they did before. We see loads of articulated buses traveling down residential streets and through neighborhoods with nobody on them. And then we have other people who are waiting at bus stops for a bus that never arrives. So we need to overhaul our public transit system to make sure it's delivering the service that people need. I'm not going to make transit free. I'm not going to invest another $145 million, as Catherine McKenney is proposing to do, until we optimize the service as it is now. That's just going to add more debt. It's going to create an even bigger deficit. We need to get the buses going where people need them to go. So we need to overhaul the system and optimize the routes. Okay. Uh, I took a call yesterday on on my show. We talked a lot about OC Transpo yesterday uh, during our talkback hour. And I took a call from an 18-year career bus driver, uh, retired now, who lives in Canada. And she said that one of the problems is that our public transit system is set up to be a commuter public transit system uh, for the public servant who lives in Canada but works at Tunney's Pasture or uh, somebody lives in Barhaven, maybe works for a law firm downtown. Uh, These kinds of things. Uh, But 
that the world of work has changed now. And she, wh- one of the things that struck me was she said it takes her 10 minutes by car to get from her house in Canada to the Tanger Outlet Mall. The same thing by bus takes an hour. So it, it seems we've, we have a transit system that's kind of um, been set up traditionally and has served us pretty well before the pandemic um, as a commuter system, but, but that now the world of work and, and commuting habits have changed, and maybe we have to rethink uh, the way we're serving the public with our public transit system. What do you think about that idea? That's exactly what I'm talking about, Rob. I've heard from several people, uh, many people at the doors, when I've been knocking on doors in Barhaven and Stittsville and Canada and Orleans and other places. Um, there, I talked to a family in, in Barhaven. Their daughter works in Canada, and it takes probably 20 minutes by car, but an hour and a half by bus to get back and forth to work. Um, so there's all kinds of examples of that, and that's exactly what I'm talking about when I say we need to overhaul the bus system, optimize the routes, and start having the buses go where people need them to go. We're living in a different world now post-pandemic. A lot fewer people, for the moment, are going downtown. I hope we can change that in the long run, but we need a transit system that works for everyone. Okay. Um, you're not anti cyclist though are you no like no you know. i am a cyclist rob okay. i am a cyclist yeah. um right. i i ride my bike okay um and and we need better cycling routes um we need to fix some of the cycling routes because some of them are in rough shape we need to fix the sides of the roads you know i've heard from so many people uh about the sidewalks and the shoulders of roads where they're dangerous and that means that bicycles have to move out into traffic uh, to avoid the potholes and other cracks in the road, and that's dangerous for them. So, but we need a balanced approach. We need a. I'm not going to prioritize one system of getting around over all the others. We need a balanced approach. We need to invest in bicycle lanes. We need to invest in public transit. We need to invest in our sidewalks and pathways, and we need to invest in the roads. And I'm just getting a little tired of the downtown mentality that some people have. I know if you live downtown. You can imagine a world like a European city or New York City. If you live in Manhattan, where you just, you know, walk to the grocery store at the corner and you you ride your bike with your kids to school or to baseball practice or whatever. It's, you know, there's a lot of people downtown who think that applies all over the city of Ottawa. The city of Ottawa is massive. It's 100 kilometers from one side to the other. There's an enormous rural component to the city of Ottawa. The suburbs, places like Canada and Stittsville and Orleans and Manatick and Barhaven, people in those communities live a different kind of life from the people who live downtown. And they need cars to get their kids sometimes to school. They need cars to go to the grocery store. They sometimes ride their bikes as well, but they're going to use their cars. And we need to respect that. We need to respect all the people who live in the suburbs and not look down our noses at them and and make them feel guilty because they're not riding their bike everywhere. Make them feel like they don't, you know, we think we know better how they should live. I I don't like that downtown mentality that's that's being enforced on the suburbs. Okay. Um, Just on on free transit, Councillor McKinney seems to have... um soften somewhat on this idea of fair free transit for all saying uh in their platform it would be 18 years of age and under uh but you're not in favor of that is that right mark Sutcliffe? Uh, that's right so uh just to be clear catherine mckinney is saying that they are in favor of fair free transit they're just going to start by having it free for people 18 and under, but but Catherine McKenney has been clear that they want to move towards fair free transit in the long run. That is the ideal that they are striving towards. So we don't know what the timetable is for that. We know that it starts with making it free for those who are 18 and under. And look, I want people to use public transit. I think there are ways we can be creative about the pricing of public transit. So for example, um, I've talked about considering ideas like maybe having two dollar saturdays or or having it free on friday evenings if we want people to go downtown there's lots of different ways that we can incentivize people to use public transit but an across the board approach to making transit free is going to cost a lot of money and it doesn't make the service any better your caller who where it takes an hour to get from canada to the the tanger outlet or the person that i spoke to where it takes an hour and a half to get from barhaven to canada to go to work making it free doesn't suddenly make that appealing 
so yeah. you got to improve the service. I'm I'm in favor of a better public transit service, not a free public transit okay. service. Another one of your rivals in this race, uh, former mayor Bob Shirelli says no new roads. Uh, we got to fix the roads that we have now before we think about building any more new roads. And this is part of his plan to free spending in the first year um, and basically have a 100-day review of everything. What do you think about uh, Bob Shirelli, what he's saying about the roads? So first of all, this is a choice between my vision for Ottawa and Catherine McKenney's vision for Ottawa. Um, I respect Bob Shirelli. Uh, I like Bob Shirelli. I've worked well with Bob Shirelli in the past. Um, Bob is pulling out every political trick available, like promising a 0% tax increase in, in the first year, which is just not feasible. Nobody thinks that's realistic. It'll only mean it'll be 8 or 10% in the second year. It's a gimmick, and I think people see through that, and I think people understand that ultimately this is a choice between Catherine McKinney and me. Okay. Mark Sutcliffe, thank you very much again this morning for joining us. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Every year, dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety. Visit stoptracktragedies.ca. Your men at home tonight. Hey, this is Dominique Orley. I'm a part of Encore 3, and be sure to catch my set this week. We are going downtown, leaving out all your stress and your sorrow. Hello, I'm Liz Dowdsville, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. In 2008, carbon monoxide, a deadly invisible gas, killed an entire family in our province. That tragedy led to a new law requiring homes with potential CO sources to have alarms. John Gignac's family members passed away that day, and he shares his story to save others. Please make sure you have working CO alarms in your home. Protect your family today. You know the story when the RCAF said Mach 2 fighter, two place, thousand mile range, the British said it was impossible. The Yanks tried twice and failed. They said, you're dreaming. We said, fine, we'll build it right here in Toronto. And now you guys, my guys, are saying that it can't be done, that they were right? Now that's the rocket that we use to get the model up to speed, and then the onboard sensor tells me. Come on, baby. Damn it! But we did it according to your specs. The specs have changed. We did it. Although the government cancelled the project and destroyed the prototypes, the Avro Arrow remains for Canada a world benchmark in aerospace achievement. Enjoy the fresh outdoors. Play an important role in the lives of school-aged children. Get paid to make a difference in your community. Become a crossing guard. We are currently recruiting crossing guards for the school year. We offer a competitive wage with various perks and opportunities for bonuses. Join the Ottawa Safety Council in keeping kids safe in the nation's capital. Find out more at crossing-guard.ca. Rogers TV presents a series of original creative stories animated by local authors for children of all ages. Join us for Ottawa Storytellers. You see a lot of these luxury rental apartments that are coming out and if you're a single person it makes it extremely challenging to afford um, just basic lifestyle needs. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Hurricane Fiona is expected to approach Nova Scotia either late tomorrow or sometime on Saturday where they are getting ready. And uh, we're joined now by Dan Allstrand. He is the news director of our uh, City News station in Halifax, 
City News 95.7. Good morning. Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm, I'm okay. What is coming your way? <laughs> Big storm. Um, Big, yeah. Obviously, with these things, uh, data and, and wind speeds and rain and track and everything else change by the minute. Um, but they are suggesting that this could be, um, and I think the Hurricane Center referred to it as a landmark weather event for Nova Scotia. Um, there are some that are suggesting it could be the the deepest low pressure that the, the province has ever seen, which low pressures obviously drive these kind of storms. So um, at this point, it looks like it's going to approach uh, with, with um, about a, a strong Category 2 or Category 3 strength wind. Uh, it will lose speed once it gets into sort of Nova Scotia waters because of the water temperature. Um, but at this point, they're forecasting Saturday morning about 9 a.m. off the shore of Nova Scotia, uh, winds of about 100 and between 130 and 175 kilometers an hour, and then it's uh, making its way for a direct hit landfall somewhere in Guysboro County, which is the far east of mainland Nova Scotia, or onto Cape Breton, which of course where Sydney and 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 such are. So yeah, where uh, my dad's but, house is. Damn. Yeah, right? great. Unfortunately, awesome. but you know, yeah. like they say, we're we're used to these kind of storms in, in this part of the world, but there's there's there is some serious concern about this one because of uh, some of the mechanics that are involved with it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about being used to this kind of storm. I mean, a hundred and seventy kilometer an hour uh, wind gust is. I mean, I grew up there, lived there for the first twenty years of my life, and I've seen the um, after effects of these storms that originally. You know, form in the Gulf and cause can cause great devastation. And you know, historically, by the time they hit off the coast of Nova Scotia, Cape Breton Island, Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, you get some strong winds and heavy rains and a big surf. But I think this is a uh, this is this is next level, Dan. It certainly is, and uh, most saying that we've we've never in recent memory have had a storm this strong on the approach. Uh, if you can harken back about three years ago, we uh, in Halifax took a direct hit from Hurricane Dorian. Yes. When Hurricane Dorian came ashore, it was a very weak two category storm uh, and losing speed rapidly. They go post-tropical, it's called, when they when they get into the colder waters of, of our part of the Atlantic. And what happens is the storms start to break apart and they lose their that that really defined eye with the eye wall and all of those things, uh, and then they lose speed very quickly because they need warm water. Warm water is the is the fuel source for a hurricane. Um, but Dorian did a number on us three years ago with our power grid and and such. There were you know uh, 500, 600,000 Nova Scotia power customers without electricity at that time. Uh, there were people that work in our newsroom that were without power for seven days with wow. uh, Hurricane Dorian, and this one's stronger. Not a direct hit on Halifax, which may be a saving grace for us living here, but for our uh, our provincial counterparts up in, in Cape Breton, um, this is, uh, some are calling this uh, like a historic level storm that they've never seen before. Yeah. And um, surprises can happen. Uh, we've seen these storms make turns before. Right, hundred percent. Uh, Dorian did. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it turned the wrong way. Turned the wrong right way. Up, yeah. yeah. Right up the Halifax Harbor, but uh, they certainly can. And uh, and Environment Canada and the and the Canadian Hurricane Center in her in Dartmouth will tell you that you know predicting a hurricane is like trying to win the lottery. Um, but it's it's with each update that we we get updates every six hours and every twelve hours on this storm. Uh, you know the the. The, the minds, the powers that be are starting to come on a consensus that just, there's going to be an impact in Nova Scotia, there's going to be landfall, and it's going to be a strong storm. It's just a question of how strong and where. Right, okay. So uh, Dan Allstrand is with us, News 95.7, our city news colleague in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where they're getting ready for the big storm. So you've, uh, as you said, you know, Dorian, yeah, there was Juan as well mm -hmm. many years ago. The, uh, Nova Scotians have been through this before. 
I mean, yeah, I remember with with Dorian. Uh, what I'll never forget with that the, the, is the viral video of that crane toppling down onto that uh, building. And I did a yeah. I did a quick look out our window here. We're we're situated just just on the periphery of downtown Halifax at the radio station. And uh, Nova Scotia has been in a building boom. And I took a quick count of cranes in the air out the window of the newsroom for what I could see, and I counted almost a dozen. Wow. Now, now they're. <laughs> Their design, that, that crane did, it did collapse, and, and there was a structural issue with it. Okay. Uh, they're designed to take the wind. They, they let them spin freely in the weather vane. But, yes, that, that, the, the crane, in fact, just a, a point to that, the, the building where that crane collapsed during Dorian is now called the crane. They called it, named it after the crane. Oh, that's collapsed. called the crane. Oh, yeah. my goodness. So, look, what are um, the emergency management officials advising people to do? Get ready. Um, right. it, it, they're advising people to, to get a, a 72 hour kit ready, uh, enough water to last those, those days. Make sure your medications, if you have medications are topped up, uh, get some cash because we may be without electricity for a while. Lots of, um, uh, non-perishable goods for food, cans of soup, cans of, of tuna or whatever, uh, and be, be prepared to, to go an extended period uh, without electricity. That tends to be the biggest issue here. And again, this is a new storm, so who knows what's going to happen with it. But power tends to be the biggest issue for us here. And uh, they're warning people to, to get ready. I was uh, across the street from the radio station. There's a uh, Atlantic Superstore there. And I was just over there half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago. Mm. And they're they're completely sold out of bottled water. So wow. okay. people, people are, are trying to stock up. They're, they're, getting, they're getting ready. Uh, and uh, I guess they're getting ready to uh, to see what happens. Well, you know, I guess uh, on the bright side, I'm just looking at the weather forecast for Halifax for Saturday, a high of 12, so a little on the chilly side. But then if people are without power, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, daytime highs of 18. So Yeah, right. and that's also yeah. unique. It's, it's a bit weird. Normally when we have a hurricane that spins up from down in the Caribbean or down around Florida or North Carolina, it brings with it a big pocket of warm air because of the way that the wind spins the difference with this storm is there's a a a trough that's coming down from the arctic and it's pulling a whole bunch of cold air down here when dorian hit it's one of the things that i remember i remember being on queen street in downtown halifax in the middle of the storm in the middle of a hundred kilometer an hour gust and sweating it was that warm wow that's going to be different this time around so each, each hurricane, each one of these storms, uh, it brings its own uniqueness to it, and I think that this one's going to be um, this one's going to be one that we're going to remember for a while. Okay. All right. Stay safe. Thank you, Dan. All the best to you and your team down there. Thanks for calling, yeah. Rob. Bye bye. Yeah. Dan Allstrand is uh, our city news colleague in Halifax, News ninety five seven, and he is the news director with again uh, this storm. Maybe the most powerful uh, to hit Nova Scotia ever. Uh, expected to be off the coast of that province sometime tomorrow night or Saturday. So we'll be that'll be a story to pay attention to over the weekend. Eleven twenty eight. Rob Snow Show. City News. Join me for season three of Paula Roy's favorite foods. was a lot. I think I need a nap. I need to know that my voice matters and feel like my opinion is going to have an impact on our society and our youth. Putting the focus on um, smaller businesses and less um, larger sized businesses as it's very different for people like me that are um, like literal small business owners where we've bootstrapped money and we don't have a lot of funding and to be able to help us through through that. Um, there has been some help for us, but I think it would be a greater opportunity to see us thrive through the next couple of years. Hi, I'm Meg from AIM Fitness, and I'm here with my buddy, Fit Finley. Join us every week for Fit Over 50. We'll take you through some low-impact and high-intensity workouts designed to improve your strength and your balance. 
All you'll need is a resistance band, some light hand weights, and also your water bottle and a sturdy chair. Tune in right here on Rogers TV and let us be part of your weekly routine. Next time on Simply Cooking by Um Chef, I'm sharing some of my Italian family secrets. Come join me and see what they are while I prepare a traditional Italian pork feast. Number one for local news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 everywhere. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Good morning, I'm Danielle Bain. Right now in Ottawa and Smiths Falls, 14 degrees, mostly cloudy skies. Here's what's making news this hour. If elected next month, mayoral candidate Mark Sutcliffe says he plans to increase investments in road maintenance and winter clearing budgets by $100 million over four years. But he tells City News he wants to bring a balanced approach to transportation and doesn't just want to focus on one aspect of his transportation plan. He says he won't prioritize one form of transportation over the others. He also plans to modernize routes and scheduling of OC Transpo that would help residents rely on public transportation, especially if they live in the suburbs. Hurricane Fiona is moving north in the Atlantic, sliding past Bermuda, where a hurricane warning has been issued. And it's expected to pick up speed tomorrow with Nova Scotia in its sights. Emergency officials in Nova Scotia are urging residents not to take this storm lightly and start preparing for the storm now. A 24-7 provincial coordination center opens tomorrow morning. And several Liberal ministers have confirmed they are discussing whether to continue the mandatory use of the ArriveCan app for international travellers and COVID-19 border restrictions like face masks, which are set to expire at the end of this month. The Cabinet has not made any final decisions, but is set to meet this afternoon as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau returns from the UN General Assembly. Prime Minister Trudeau has not confirmed whether his government is ready to lift or change any of the pandemic measures but says they will continue to follow the advice of public health experts. City News Time, 11.32. I'm Danielle Bain for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 13.10 AM. It's time for our weekly examination of the biggest international news stories. We call it The World. With Professor Elliot Tepper, Distinguished Senior Fellow, Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Good morning and welcome back, Professor. No, good morning, Rob. Let's talk about what we're hearing from the Russian leadership. Plans to call up 300,000 reservists. Um, more bellicose rhetoric about the use of weapons of mass destruction. This is no bluff, says Putin. Yes. Plans to have um, sh what I call sham referendums. Uh, and meantime, on the home front, they have um, anti-war demonstrations. Right. What do you make of it all? Oh, quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> uh, in terms of, I, I guess the uh, I'll sum it up and we'll break it down into parts. But, sure thing. Yeah. Uh, the world is now in peril, but so is so is Mr. Putin. Uh, in terms of the, and of course the people of Ukraine are paying the cost. The um, the plans to call up three hundred thousand reservists. Uh, a few things on that. First of all, that's double the size of the estimated original invasion force uh, of approximately one hundred fifty thousand that went into Ukraine to. Uh, do you know, plan A, you know, three days and we'll, we'll wipe out the leadership of Ukraine and we'll take Kiev and we'll put in a puppet government and they will join Mother Russia and that'll be the end of that. We know that didn't happen. So they went to plan B, which was, okay, really what we want is to complete our conquest of the Donbass region, the two oblasts there, the, uh, the two administrative units or provinces there. 
and then after that we will connect it up by land down down to a, a land corridor down to Crimea and we will basically dismember the Ukrainian state and that's what they had in mind uh, you mentioned in your note to me earlier that uh, yes uh, this is considered unprecedented it is the first time since Second World War that troops have been mobilized in this fashion but you pointed out that in fact a lot of troops were sent into Afghanistan and also Chechnya earlier Mm -hmm. uh, that's your your observation and my quick observation on that is Mr. Putin perhaps should have paid more attention to that because in Afghanistan those Russian troops sorry Soviet troops came roaring in and then limp, limped home in defeat a decade later yes. which shortly after that many people think led to the collapse of the Soviet Union which he is you know the empire uh, collapsed and that's what he wants to prevent so it, that's just a, a footnote on that okay and Chechnya as well, you mentioned, and the techniques that he perfected in Chechnya, as well as in Syria, of massive devastation followed by an assault by ground troops, that's what he's applying now okay. in Ukraine. So a lot of lessons there. Okay. The, um, the speech was very interesting, and you have to also read the transcript, Rob, afterwards. Okay. The speech was... Um, the short form that which came out was we are going to do two things which you pointed out one is we are going to have these sham and you're, everybody now along with you are calling these sham referendums and we will have those areas which are not actually fully under our control but partially under our control in the Donbass and around Kherson and Zaporizhia we will make them Russian sovereign territory right very important and then the next it's thing like Crimea said, all over again right Pardon? Kind of like Crimea all over again? Yes, uh, yeah. Crimea all over again, but more so. Okay. Because he immediately followed up, immediately followed up by saying, we will not accept any uh, attack on Russian sovereign territory, and anybody who does attack us, and this is what the big headlines are, will face the full, you know, all everything we've got, which means nukes, and uh, we are not bluffing. So quite clearly, he is raising the stakes and trying to change the um, the terms of this war. It, it's the response we were waiting for, Rob, because after after the shocking assault on Kharkiv and the success of the Ukrainian armed forces in really routing the Russian forces, um, what was he going to do? This was his second major defeat. And now we know what he wanted to do, what he plans to do. Yeah. And look, uh, we, you know, the vote has come in, and the people of Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson, they actually want to be part of Russia. And that's why we're here. We have denazified them, right? Yes. Yeah. And now if you come in here, uh, Ukraine and your uh, cronies in the West, we'll unleash holy hell on you. Right. This okay. is no bluff. This is no bluff. Yeah. So what he's saying here is, um, you know, he's laying it all on the line. The um, so I guess my question would be, uh, you know, because some people are saying, well, is it a bluff or is it not? Um, <laughs> and what do you do about even the bluff? It, well, even if it is a, do you want to call the bluff? <laughs> exactly. Um, what do you do? What is it? What does that even look like if you call a bluff like that? Well, he he said really two things. Uh, related things in, uh, that you just alluded to in his long, longer speech. Very short speech by mm -hmm. his standards, only, only seven minutes. But he said what really this is, ha is happening, is what's going on are two things. One is the West now wants to continue the dismemberment of Russia. That really, yes. Yes. 1991, that is Ukraine's independence, they took a part of Russia away from us. And what they want to do now is really complete the destruction of of Russia itself and set the different units inside Russia, the Federation, against each other and destroy us. So a direct threat, not just in Chechnya, not just in um, Ukraine, but also the motherland itself is, is under immediate imminent threat and we have to do something. The second thing you just alluded to, yes, well, we have to go in and now complete the denazification, protect our Russians from these Nazis. And now we know as people are as the Russians are withdrawing, these heavily Russian-speaking areas, ethnically Russian areas, where he expected to be greeted with flowers, they've now 
put up with the brutal suppression of everything about them during this long occupation by Russia, I doubt they would uh, be very cheerfully joining the mother union, you know, the motherland right. under these circumstances. So uh, what are we going to do now is a big question. The starting with Canada, uh, since, you know, we're sure. here, yep. you know, yep. but everybody is saying we will not recognize the results of these sham elections. But the Ukrainian president has said we, of course, are not going to accept this. One of the things that um, has been pointed out is that the West, in, in response to what are we going to do now, the West has been increasing its supply of increasingly effective weapons as the Ukrainian armed forces show they are so successful in using them. So that's been raising the ante against Russia in that sense. But the underlining, the, the main point all along has been by President Biden repeatedly. We are not going to attack Russia. Russia should not feel we are attacking them. We are um, allowing the, Ukrainian, the Ukrainians to defend themselves. We do not want World War III. And I want to give you credit, Rob, if you go back to our earliest, earliest comments in February about this. Uh, the very first question you asked me right off the bat was, are we headed to World War III? You were way ahead of mm. <laughs> seeing the implications on that. That's very kind of you, yeah. And we, in fact, are faced with the possibility that the world is in peril because what do you do now? What's going to happen next? Ukraine isn't going to stop. Putin has put it on the line. I want to circle back to his view of the West, his view yes. of the West. Uh, there. I think there's um, kind of emerging evidence here that Mr. Putin has this paranoia that the West is out to get Russia, right? Um, and that the big threat is is um, color revolutions. We've talked right. about these in the past. Right. Um, the colored revo the colored revolutions. It, there, it, there have been ex there's been extensive media reporting by very credible news organizations that um, Vladimir Putin was really affected by what happened to uh, Gaddafi in Libya, right? And and viewed that as as um, you know the West meddling in other countries' affairs, and that he didn't want to meet the same fate. Right. And that this fuels this, this this paranoia that he has about the West trying to plant the seeds of another colored revolution. Do you make anything of that, Professor? Do you think there yes. might be something to that? Or, Well, um, if we have a theme, there's a couple other stories we might talk about. Yeah. Is that we have autocratic regimes, dictatorships around the world that are worried about being overthrown by popular revolutions, which are being called color revolutions. Color revolutions. Yeah. Uh, it, and it happened twice in Ukraine, right next door to them, and there was a real threat to Lukashenko and Belarus of uh, these popular uprisings, uh, people power, color revolutions, overthrowing dictatorships and autocrats. So I think he has an excellent reason to be concerned about that, and should continue with our theme about uh, Russia and Ukraine and what it, the speech said, I think not only is the world now in peril, but he's also put himself on the line at home. Mr. Putin may be in some peril for the first time, and what we are hearing, if you closely parse what he said, is, I've decided to listen to my military people about the need for a call-up. This settled a debate inside his closest <laughs> circle from the political people who said, you cannot call this up because, Mr. Putin, the people you care about the most have not felt the results of this war. If you do mobilization, they're going to start feeling it because the people that have been doing the fighting apparently overwhelmingly are from Dagestan and uh, Chechnya, drawn in from there and 50,000 prisoners released from jail and the Wagner group, uh, the mercenaries who are fighting. But now this mobilization, and if you read the details on that, it's now going to be based on the population center, which means the large population centers, Moscow and St. Petersburg, 
are now going to start feeling mobilization leading to that right <laughs> and this is the where the this is where the big anti-war thing. demonstrations are happening right, right? so exactly. um you know they made 1200 arrests so you can oh, imagine right. how many people were in the streets if they arrested 1200 people and back to you know our talk about uprisings and co- you know color revolutions i i suspect the response would be something along the well there's the west it's meddling and it's it's planting the seeds for this um uh, opposition here you know he can he can try that yeah <laughs> but he's tried uh, it one, in the past yeah one yeah. of the things to that i think got far too little attention is we are now talking about the fact that mr putin for the first time may be getting severe pushback at home mm. that he's by putting it on the line in terms of the west and the war in ukraine he's also putting himself on the line at home uh, and we saw this immediate uprisings, uh, these protests across all across the country. It started in the Far East, <laughs> so, you know, so really all across the country. It, this is after having preemptively put on the books, uh, Rob, much harsher penalties for even using the word war and protests. So you can really, these people are seriously putting themselves in danger. One thing that didn't get a lot of attention is that the local municipal councils in Moscow and St. Petersburg, the local councillors are starting to pass resolutions Mm -hmm. and signing petitions and trying to get other councillors across across Russia to say, we don't like this war. And one of them even went so far as saying, Mr. Putin is a traitor. And they're, these are St. Petersburg, as you know, is his home base. Yes. Uh, and where, where the core of his... Um, That's really where his career began. Uh, yes, and yeah. he brought those people with him. And yeah. the KGB, when, or the FSB, when he took yeah. it over, he brought the St. Petersburg people with him. Yeah. It's from St. Petersburg and now Moscow as well that we're getting from elected, you know, the local, local representatives are now also pushing back. So this is a huge gamble for the world. It's also a gamble for Mr. Putin. Okay. We'll stop here with Professor Elliot Tepper, part two of The World, next on The Rob Snow Show, City News. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. On Thursday's Daytime Ottawa, it is the first day of fall, so we're going to share with you some fabulous fall recipes. And of course, fall means some of the colder temperatures are coming, and that means cold and flu season. We'll give you some great tips on how to prevent cold and flu, and of course, we'll give you some great tips on if you do get the cold and flu, how do you battle it? And the Chio Dream of a Lifetime Lottery is back. They have an early deadline coming up. We'll give you all the details on Thursday. I'm Julian Armour from Music and Beyond. Join us for a new show this spring on Rogers called Music and Beyond Presents. Flooding is causing widespread devastation in Pakistan. More than a thousand people have died. One third of the country is underwater and six million people are in need of emergency assistance. The humanitarian coalition is responding to the crisis in Pakistan. You can help. Donate today at together.ca and your donation will be matched by the Canadian government. That's together.ca, the humanitarian coalition. Together, saving more lives. Focus, better. Partner, better. Sleep, 
better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. What are we doing about COVID? Seems like the communications have been all about how everything's opening up, and yet here in Ottawa, we're experiencing our seventh wave, so a bit of a contradiction there. opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Back with Professor Elliot Tepper, part two of The World. Uh, final thoughts for this week on Russia, Professor Tepper, or shall we move along? Yes, the final thoughts are that uh, we are in a different place today than we were a week ago as a result of the raising of the stakes by Mr. Putin. Uh, the UN is meeting now, but remember it wasn't long ago that the UN General Secretary General said this. Uh, he was talking uh, to the uh, non-proliferation 10-year review, saying that the world is only one miscalculation and one mistake away from nuclear annihilation. And that's a frightening way to wrap it up in terms of uh, what's going on. But there's no doubt that Mr. Putin has gambled. He's losing that gamble. He's now raised the stakes. Now, you mentioned the United Nations General Assembly. Both Prime Minister Trudeau attended. Uh, President Biden gave a speech yesterday. Right. You have spoken uh, out in the past about the need for multilateral institutions. We right. are in a polarized world. Right. You have used the term in the past thickening borders. We have borders that are thickening. There's um, populism and nativism, I guess. So, but seriously, there is some suspicion about the value of an institution like the United Nations. Right. What value does it have? Yes. Uh, a few things. Well, first of all, we only have one universal membership organization, and that is the United Nations. And that's, uh, it's the apex <laughs> of international organizations. Uh, it even has clauses in its charter saying we recognize the role for regional organizations like the OAS, for example, underneath it. Yesterday, Janice Stein, whom I consider to be the dean of political scientists in Canada, a very wise person has said that the United Nations is seriously underperforming, and I, I, I nobody nobody can disagree with that. Uh, the hopes that were pinned on the United Nations have not come to fruition. President Zelensky, since we were talking about Ukraine, uh, addressed the uh, the General Assembly, and he got a standing ovation when he said that the UN is now failing in its fundamental job, preserving world peace, uh, and uh, everybody stood up and said, yes, we agree with that. We should probably review a bit about the UN and the nature of these organizations. Sure. The United Nations was meant to be the successful successor to the failed League of Nations, uh, which came after the end of the First World War. The Second World War, uh, since the League failed, and the UN, U.S. didn't join, among other things, uh, they said, we're going to fix it. So what we're going to do is we're dividing it into three parts. The Sec Security Council, which is what we all hear the most about, that's the five permanent members. They were the victors in the Second World War. Rob, they're supposed to be the directorate of the world. You get these, these states to agree with each other, and they will guide the world, and they will, that will keep the peace. And then there was the General Assembly, which is the, really the policy-making organization, but it's really the talk shop. It's, it's where everybody is equal, uh, no one state more or less than the other, and everybody has an, every state has an equal voice and can raise any issue whatsoever, and they can occasionally take action and set policy. And the third part were the functional agencies. We forget about those sometimes, but, you know, they're important, UNESCO and UNICEF. Um, so those, those carry on doing really useful things okay there's we i can I'm carry sorry. on on this one because um <laughs> well we're, we only have about three minutes left oh here, no so, really um i must ask you because it's sure. all over social media uh and there are some questions about how long 
it will be on social media because th there's a crackdown now on the internet in Iran. Right. They've removed to um, restrict the internet. Uh, we see mass protest in Iran. This um, would be the sixth day. Restrictions placed on social media. All of this erupted over the death in detention last week of a woman named Masa Amini. Right. 22 years old, Iranian Kurdistan, arrested in Tehran for unsuitable attire. Right. And beaten to death by the so-called morality police. Right. The morality police. I read Terry Glavin's... Uh, oh comment in the National Post today he holds out he 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 holds out no hope that this will lead to any lasting change in Iran and I get the sense that you think this will be crushed this yes process. the the first thing I'm going to do is when we're off this program is go read Terry's column uh, I have great uh, respect for his his uh, research as well as his use of language uh, yeah I think there's three big points to remember about Iran uh, the the first is that um, when you talk about Iran, you're talking about a history of a country. I'd like to speak a lot about Iran. A history of a country that came under the control of a theocracy in 1979, that they have a long history now of uprisings, which they put down successfully uh, with great brutality. The, that's why when we see this come up, well, this is a regime that knows how to deal with dissent. They put it down, and they put it down brutally. Why haven't they done even more yet? The speculation is that, well, you know, the president is at the U.N., and he, they don't want to be crushing dissent at home. But when he gets home, which will be, you know, today, tomorrow, the next few days, mm -hmm. then this will also be crushed. The second thing to remember is there's a Canadian dimension to all this in all kinds of ways. The Canadian caper, they've got a grudge against Canada. But also, Zara Kazemi, we should not forget the names of those Canadians with Iranian dual citizenship who have been arrested and uh, tortured and murdered in, in Iranian jails. The third thing quickly, and, I, and I, 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 we have to remember them, the third thing is the Iran nuclear deal is back under discussion. This is, has enormous uh, portent for the future, mm. and we have a, the possibility that the need for oil in the market is going to, I'm, it worries me, Rob, is going to skew these. Uh, everybody, both sides now want, want this deal to go ahead. Uh, the U.S. in particular, of course, says what's all about nukes, but it may be all about oil. Uh, over a billion dollar, uh, barrels a day might c come back into the market. So there's a lot to talk about when we talk about um, when we talk Iran. about Iran, and don't forget Flight 752, which the Ukrainian airliner shot down by the Revolutionary Guards in Iran, with uh, the, the majority of the, pop, or the people killed, 176 killed, were people connected to Canada. Okay. You've given us lots to think about once more, Professor Tepper. Thank you so much. Uh, these are always... I enjoy these conversations, even though they talk about serious and sometimes gloomy things. That's what's happening in our world. Thank you. From Carleton University, that is Professor Elliot Tepper. And that is The Rob Snow Show on City News. The Rob Snow Show. Tune in weekdays starting at 9 on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley.